This is a LibriVox.org recording by J. C. Guan. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3. Chapter 52. The Return Home. O oh, lonesomeness! My home, lonesomeness! Too long have I lived wildly in wild remoteness to return to thee without tears. Now threaten me with the finger as mothers threaten. Now smile upon me as mothers smile. Now say just, who was it that like a whirlwind once rushed away from me? Who, when the parting called out, too long have I sat with lonesomeness. There have I unlearned silence. That hast thou learned now, surely? O Zarathustra, everything do I know, and that thou wert more forsaken amongst the many, thou unique one, than thou ever wert with me. One thing is forsakenness, Another matter is lonesomeness. That hast thou now learned, and that, amongst men, thou wilt ever be wild and strange. Wild and strange, even when they love thee, for above all, they want to be treated indulgently. Here, however, art thou at home, and house with thyself, here canst thou utter everything, and unbosom all motives. Nothing is here ashamed of concealed, congealed feelings. Here do all things come caressingly to thy talk, and flatter thee, for they want to ride upon thy back. On every smile dost thou here ride to every truth, Uprightly and openly mayest thou here talk to all things, and verily it soundeth as praise in their ears for one to talk to all things directly. Another matter, however, is forsakenness. For dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thy bird screamed overhead? When thou stoodest in the forest, irresolute, ignorant where to go, beside a corpse. When thou speakest, let mine animals lead me. More dangerous have I found it among men than among animals. That was forsakenness. And dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thou satest in thine isle, a well of wine giving and granting amongst empty buckets, bestowing and disturbing amongst the thirsty. Until at last thou alone satest thirsty among the drunken ones, and wailedst nightly, is taking not more blessed than giving, and stealing yet more blessed than taking, that was forsakenness. And dost thou remember, O Zarathustra, when thy silly hour came and drove thee forth from thyself, when with wicked whispering it said, Speak and succumb, when it disgusted thee with all thy waiting and silence, and discouraged thy humble courage? That was forsakenness. O oh, lonesomeness, my home, lonesomeness, how blessed and tenderly speaketh thy voice unto me. We do not question each other, we do not complain to each other. We go together openly through open doors, for all is open with thee and clear, and even the hours run here on lighter feet. For in the dark, 
Time weighted heavier upon one than in the light. Here fly open unto me all beings' words and word cabinets. Here all being wanted to become words. Here all becoming wanted to learn of me how to talk. Down there, however, all talking is in vain. There, forgetting and passing by, are the best wisdom. That have I learned now. He who would understand everything in man must handle everything. But for that, I have two clean hands. I do not like even to inhale their breath, alas, that I have lived so long among their nose and bad breaths. Oh, blessed stillness around me! Oh, pure odors around me! How from a deep breast this stillness fetches pure breath! How it hearkeneth this blessed stillness! But down there, there speaketh everything. There is everything misheard. If one announce one's wisdom with bells, the shopman in the market-place will out-jingle it with pennies. Everything among them talketh. No one knoweth any longer how to understand. Everything falleth into the water. Nothing falleth any longer into deep wells. Everything among them talketh. Nothing succeedeth any longer and accomplished itself. Everything crackled. But who will still sit quietly on the nest and hatch eggs? Everything among them talketh. Everything is out-talked. And that which yesterday was still too hard for time itself and its tooth, hang it to-day out-champed and out-chewed from the mouths of the men of to-day. Everything among them talketh, everything is betrayed, and what was once called the secret and secrecy of profound souls belongeth to-day to the street trumpeters and other butterflies. O oh, human hubbub, thou wonderful thing, Thou noise in dark streets, Now art thou again behind me. My greatest danger lieth behind me. In indulging and pitying Lay ever my greatest danger, And all human hubbub Wisheth to be indulged and tolerated. With suppressed truths, With false hand and befalled heart, And rich in petty lies of pity, thus have I ever lived among men, disguised that I sit amongst them, ready to misjudge myself, that I might endure them, and willingly saying to myself, Thou fool, thou dost not know them. One unlearneth men, when one liveth amongst them, there is too much foreground in all men. What can far-seeing, far-longing eyes do there? And, fool that I was, when they misjudged me, I indulged them on that account more than myself, being habitually hard on myself, and often even taking revenge on myself for the indulgence stung all over by poisonous flies, and hollowed like the stone by many drops of wickedness. Thus did I sit among them, and still said to myself, Innocent is everything petty of its pettiness. Especially did I find those who call themselves the good, the most poisonous flies. They sting in all innocence, they lie in all innocence. 
How could they be just toward me? He who liveth amongst the good, pity teacheth him to lie. Pity maketh stifling air for all free souls. For the stupidity of the good is unfathomable. To conceal myself and my riches, that did I learn down there. For every one did I still find poor in spirit. It was the lie of my pity that I knew in every one, that I saw and scented in every one what was enough of spirit for him, and what was too much. They're stiff, wise men. I call them wise, not stiff. Thus did I learn to slur over words. The grave diggers dig for themselves diseases. Under old rubbish rest bad vapors. One should not stir up the marsh. One should live on mountains. With blessed nostrils do I again breathe mountain freedom. Free at last is my nose from the smell of all human hubbub. With the sharp breezes tickled, as with sparkling wine, sneezes my soul, sneezes and shouteth self-congratulatingly, Health to thee! Thus spake Zarathustra. End of Part 3 Chapter 53This is a LibriVox.org recording by J. C. Guan. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. Part 3, Chapter 54 The Three Evil Things Part 1 In my dream, in my last morning dream, I stood today on a promontory, beyond the world. I held a pair of scales, and weighed the world. Alas, that the rosy dawn came too early to me. She glowed me awake, the jealous one. Jealous is she always of the glows of my morning dream. Measurable by him who has time, weighable by a good weigher, attainable by strong pinions, divinable by divine nutcrackers. Thus did my dream find the world. My dream, a bold sailor, half ship, half hurricane, silent as the butterfly, impatient as the falcon. How had it the patience and leisure today for world weighing? Did my wisdom, perhaps, speak secretly to it? My laughing, wide-awake day wisdom, which mocketh all the infinite worlds, for it saith, where forces, there becometh number the master, it hath more force. How confidently did my dream contemplate this finite world, not new-fangledly, not old-fangledly, not timidly, not entreatingly, as if a big round apple presented itself to my hand, a ripe golden apple with a coolly soft velvety skin. Thus did the world present itself unto me, as if a tree nodded unto me, a broad-branched, strong-willed tree, curved as a recline and a footstool for weary travellers. Thus did the world stand on my promontory, as if delicate hands carried a casket towards me, a casket open for the delectation of modest, adoring eyes. Thus did the world present itself before me today. 
not riddle enough to scare human love from it, not solution enough to put to sleep human wisdom. A humanly good thing was the world to me to-day, of which such bad things are said. How I thank my morning dream that I thus at to-day's dawn weighed the world, as a humanly good thing did it come unto me, this dream and hard comforter, and that I may do the like by day, and imitate and copy its best. Now will I put the three worst things on the scales, and weigh them humanly well. He who taught to bless, taught also to curse, what are the three best cursed things in the world? These will I put on the scales. Voluptuousness, passion for power, and selfishness. These three things have hitherto been best cursed, and have been in worst and falsest repute. These three things will I weigh humanly well. Well, here is my promontory, and there is the sea. It rolleth hither unto me, shaggily and fawningly, the old, faithful, hundred-headed dog-monster that I love. Well, here will I hold the scales over the weltering sea, and also a witness do I choose to look on, thee, the anchorite tree, thee, the strong-odored, broad-arched tree that I love. On what bridge goeth the now to the hereafter? By what constraint doth the high stoop to the low? And what enjoineth even the highest still to grow upwards? Now stand the scales, poised and at rest. Three heavy questions have I thrown in. Three heavy answers carrieth the other scale. Part Two Voluptuousness Unto all hair-shirted despisers of the body, a sting and stake, and cursed as the world by all backworldsmen, for it mocketh and befalls all erring, misinfering teachers. Voluptuousness To the rabble, the slow fire at which it is burnt, to all wormy wood, to all stinking rags, the prepared heat and stew furnace. Voluptuousness To free hearts, a thing innocent and free, the garden happiness of the earth, all the future's thanks overflow to the present. Voluptuousness, only to the withered and sweet poison, to the lion willed, however, the great cordial and the reverently saved wine of wines. Voluptuousness, the great symbolic happiness of a higher happiness and highest hope, for to many is marriage promised, and more than marriage. To many that are more unknown to each other than man and woman, and who hath fully understood how unknown to each other are man and woman. Voluptuousness, but I will have hedges around my thoughts, and even around my words, lest swine and libertine should break into my gardens. Passion for power, the glowing scourge of the hardest of the heart-hard, the cruel torture reserved for the cruelest themselves, the gloomy flame of living pious. Passion for power, the wicked gadfly, which is mounted on the vainest peoples, the scorner of all uncertain virtue, which rideth on every horse and on every pride. Passion for power, the earthquake, 
which breaketh and upbreaketh all that is rotten and hollow, the rolling, rumbling, punitive demolisher of whited sepulchres, the flashing interrogative sun behind premature answers. Passion for power, before whose glance man creepeth and croucheth and drudgeth and becometh lower than the serpent and the swine. Until at last great contempt cried out of him. Passion for power, the terrible teacher of great contempt, which preaches to their face to cities and empires, Away with thee! Until a voice crieth out of themselves, Away with me! Passion for power, which, however, mounteth alluringly even to the pure and lonesome, and up to self-satisfied elevations, glowing like a love that painteth purple felicities alluring on earthly heavens. Passion for power. But who would call it passion when the height longeth to stoop for power? Verily, Nothing sick or diseased is there in such longing and descending. That the lonesome height may not for ever remain lonesome and self-sufficing. That the mountains may come to the valleys and the winds of the heights to the plains. Oh, who could find the right prenomen and honouring name for such longing? Bestowing virtue... Thus did Zarathustra once name the unnameable. And then it happened also, and verily it happened for the first time, that his word blessed selfishness, the wholesome, healthy selfishness that springeth from the powerful soul. From the powerful soul to which the high body appertaineth, the handsome, triumphing, refreshing body, around which everything becometh a mirror, the pliant, persuasive body, the dancer, whose symbol and epitome is the self-enjoying soul. Of such bodies and souls, the self-enjoyment calls itself virtue. With its words of good and bad, Doth such self-enjoyment shelter itself as with sacred groves? With the names of its happiness doth it banish from itself everything contemptible? Away from itself doth it banish everything cowardly? It says, bad, that is cowardly. Contemptible seemed to it the ever solicitous, the sighing, the complaining, and whoever pick up the most trifling advantage. It despiseth also all bittersweet wisdom, for verily there is also wisdom that bloometh in the dark, a nightshade wisdom, which ever sighs, all is vain. Shy distrust is regarded by it as a base, and every one who wanteth oaths instead of looks and hands. Also, all over-distrustful wisdom, for such is the mode of cowardly souls. Baser still, it regardeth the obsequious, doggish one, who immediately lieth on his back, the submissive one. And there is also wisdom in that submissive and doggish and pious and obsequious hateful to it altogether, and the loathing, is he who will never defend himself, he who swalloweth down poisonous spittle and bad looks, the all-too-patient one, the all-endurer, the all-satisfied one, for that is the mode of slaves. Whether they be servile before gods and divine spurnings, or before men and stupid human opinions. At all kinds of slaves 
doth it spit, this blessed selfishness. Bad, thus doth it call all that its spirit broke in, and sordidly servile, constrained, blinking eyes, depressed hearts, and the false submissive style, which kisseth with broad cowardly lips, and spurious wisdom, so doth it call all the wit that slaves and hoary-headed and weary ones affect, and especially all the cunning, spurious-witted, curious-witted foolishness of priests. The spurious wise, however, all the priests, the world-weary, and those whose souls are of feminine and servile nature. Oh, how hath their game all along abused selfishness? And precisely that was to be virtue, and was to be called virtue, to abuse selfishness. And selfless, so did they wish themselves with good reason, all those world-weary cowards and cross-bitters. But to all those cometh now the day, the change, the sword of judgment, the great noontide. Then shall many things be revealed. And he who proclaimed the ego wholesome and holy, and selfishness blessed, verily, he, the prognosticator, speaketh also what he knoweth. Behold, it cometh, it is nigh, the great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of Part 3, Chapter 54This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Shim and Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 3, Chapter 55 The Spirit of Gravity 1. My mouthpiece is of the people. Too coarsely and cordially do I talk for Angora rabbits. And still stranger soundeth my words unto all ink-fish and pen-foxes. My hand is a fool's hand. Woe unto all tables and walls, and whatever hath room for a fool's sketching, fool's scrawling. My foot is a horse-foot. Therewith do I trample and trot over stick and stone, in the fields up and down, and am bedeviled with a delight in all fast racing. My stomach is surely an eagle's stomach, for it prefereth lamb's flesh. Certainly it is a bird's stomach, nourished with innocent things, and with few, ready and impatient to fly away. Now that is my nature. Why should there not be something of bird nature therein? And especially that I am hostile to the spirit of gravity. That is bird nature. Verily, deadly hostile. Supremely hostile, originally hostile. O whither hath my hostility not flown and misflown? Thereof could I sing a song, and will sing it, though I be alone in an empty house, and must sing it to my own ears. Other singers there are, to be sure, to whom only the full house maketh the voice soft, the hand eloquent, the eye expressive, the heart wakeful, those do I not resemble. 2. He who one day teacheth men to fly will have shifted all landmarks. To him will all landmarks themselves fly into the air. The earth will he christen anew as the light body. The ostrich runneth faster than the fastest horse, but it also thrusts its head heavily into the heavy earth. Thus it is with men who cannot yet fly. Heavy unto him are earth and life, and so willeth the spirit of gravity. But he who would become light and be a bird must love himself 
thus do I teach. Not, to be sure, with the love of the sick and infected, for with them stinketh even self-love. One must learn to love oneself, thus do I teach, with a wholesome and healthy love, that one may endure to be with oneself, and not go roving about. Such roving about christen itself brotherly love. With these words hath there hitherto been the best lying and dissembling, and especially by those who have become burdensome to every one. And verily, it is no commandment for today and tomorrow to learn to love oneself. Rather, it is of all arts the finest, subtlest, last, and most patient. For to its possessor is all possessions well concealed, and of all treasure pits one's own is last excavated, so causeth the spirit of gravity. Almost in the cradle we are apportioned with heavy words and worths. Good and evil, so calleth itself this dowry. For the sake of it we are forgiven for living. And therefore suffereth one little children to come unto one, to forbid them betimes to love themselves. So causeth the spirit of gravity. And we, we bear loyally what is apportioned unto us, on hard shoulders, over rugged mountains. And when we sweat, then do people say to us, Yea, life is hard to bear. But man himself only is hard to bear. The reason thereof is that he carrieth too many extraneous things on his shoulders. Like the camel kneeleth he down, and letteth himself be well laden. Especially the strong load-bearing man, in whom reverence resideth. Too many extraneous heavy words and worths loaded he upon himself. Then seemeth life to him a desert. And verily, many a thing also that is our own is hard to bear. And many internal things in man are like the oyster, repulsive and slippery and hard to grasp. And so an elegant shell with elegant adornment, must plead for them. But this art also one must learn, to have a shell, and a fine appearance, and a sagacious blindness. Again, it deceiveth about many things in men, that many a shell is poor, and pitiable, and too much of a shell. Many concealeth goodness, and power is never dreamed of. The choicest dainties find no tasters. Women know that the choicest of them, a little fatter, a little leaner, oh, how much fate is in so little! Man is difficult to discover, and unto himself most difficult of all, often lieth the spirit concerning the soul, so causeth the spirit of gravity. He, however, hath discovered himself who saith, This is my good and evil. Therewith hath he silenced the mole and the dwarf, who saith, Good for all, evil for all. Verily neither do I like those who call everything good, and this world the best of all. Those do I call the all-satisfied. All-satisfiedness, which knoweth how to taste everything, that is not the best taste. I honour the refractory, fastidious tongues, and stomachs, which hath learnt to say I, and yea, and nay. To cheweth and digest everything, however, that is genuine swine nature. Ever to say yea, that hath only the ass learnt, and those like it. Deep yellow and hot red, so wanteth my taste. It mixeth blood with all colours. He, however, who whitewasheth his house, betrayeth unto me a whitewashed soul. With mummies some fall in love, others with phantoms, both alike hostile to all flesh and blood. Oh, how repugnant are both to my taste, for I love blood. And there will not I reside and abide, where every one spitteth and speweth. That is now my taste, Rather I would live among the thieves and perjurers, 
Nobody carrieth gold in his mouth. Still more repugnant to me, however, are all lick spittles, and the most repugnant animal of man that I have found did I christen parasite. It would not love, and would yet live by love. Unhappily do I call all those who have only one choice, either to become evil beasts or evil beast tamers. Among such would I not build my tabernacle. Unhappy do I call those who have ever to wait. They are repugnant to my taste. All toll-gatherers and traders and kings and other landskeepers and shopkeepers. Verily, I learn waiting also, and thoroughly so, but only waiting for myself. And above all that I learn standing and walking and running and leaping and climbing and dancing. This, however, is my teaching. He who wisheth to one day to fly must first learn standing and walking and running and climbing and dancing. One doth not fly into flying. With rope ladders learn I to reach many a window. With nimble legs do I climb high masts. To sit on high masts of perception seemed to me no small bliss. To flicker like small flames on high masts. A small light, certainly, but a great comfort to cast away sailors and shipwrecked ones. By diverse ways and wendings did I arrive at my truth. Not by one ladder did I mount to the height where mine eye roveth to my remoteness. And unwillingly did I ask my way. That was always counter to my taste. Rather did I question and test the ways themselves. A testing and a questioning hath been all my travelling. And verily, one must also learn to answer such questioning. That, however, is my taste. Neither a good nor a bad taste, but my taste, of which I no longer have either shame nor secrecy. This is now my way. Where is yours? Thus did I answer those who ask me the way. For the way, it doth not exist. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part three, chapter fifty-five, The Spirit of Gravity. Read and recorded by Tim Sherman Chase, April 2008. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3, Chapter 56. Old and New Tables. 1. Here do I sit and wait. Old broken tables around me and also new half-written tables. When cometh mine hour? The hour of my descent, of my down-going, for once more will I go unto men. For that hour do I now wait, for first must the signs come unto me that it is mine hour, namely, the laughing lion with a flock of doves. Meanwhile do I talk to myself, as one who hath time. No one telleth me anything new, so I telleth myself my own story. 2. When I came unto men, then I found them resting on an old infatuation. All of them thought they had long known what was good and bad for men. An old wearisome business seemed to them all discourse about virtue. And he wished to sleep well, spoke of good and bad, ere retiring to rest. This solemnness I did disturb, when I taught that no one yet knoweth what is good and bad, unless it be the creating one. It is he, however, who createth man's goal, and giveth to the earth its meaning and its future. He only effecteth it that aught is good or bad. 
and I bade them upset their old academic chairs, and wherever that old infatuation sat, I bade them laugh at their great moralists, their saints, their poets, and their saviours. At their gloomy sages did I bid them laugh, and whoever hath sat admonishingly as a black scarecrow on the tree of life. On their great grave highway did I seat myself, and even beside the carrion and vultures, and I laughed at all their bygone and its mellow decaying glory. Verily, like the penitential preachers and fools, did I cry wrath and shame on all their greatness and smallness. Oh, that their vest is so very small! Oh, that their worst is so very small! Thus did I laugh. Thus did my wise longing, born in the mountains, cry and laugh in me. A wild wisdom, verily, my great pinion rustling longing. And oft did it carry me off, and up, and away, and in the midst of laughter. Then flew I quivering like an arrow, with sun-intoxicated rapture, out into distant futures, which no dream hath yet seen into warmer souls than ever sculptor conceived, where gods in their dancing are ashamed of all clothes, paren, that I may speak in parables, and halt and stammer, like the poets, and verily I am ashamed that I have still to be a poet, in paren, where all becoming seem to me dancing of gods, and the wantoning of gods, and the world unloosed and unbridled, and fleeing back to itself, as an eternal self-fleeing, and re-seeking of one another of many gods, as the blessing of self-contradiction, recommuting and refraternizing of one another of many gods, where all time seemed to me a blessed mockery of moments, when necessity of freedom itself, which played happily with the gold of freedom, where I also found again my old devil and arch-enemy, the spirit of gravity, and all that had created, constraint, law, necessity and consequence, and purpose, and will, and good, and evil. For must there not be that which is danced over, danced beyond? Must there not, for the sake of the nimble, the nimblest, be moles, and clumsy dwarves? 3. There was it also where I picked up from the path the word superman, and that man is something that must be surpassed, that man is a bridge and not a goal, rejoicing over his noontides and evenings as advances to new rosy dawns. The Zarathustra word of the great noontide, and whatever else I have hung up over men like purple evening afterglows, Verily, also new stars did I make them see, along with new nights, and over cloud and day and night did I spread out laughter like gay-coloured canopy. I taught them that all my poetization and aspiration, to compose and to collect into unity what is fragment in men, and riddle and fearful chance. As composer, riddle reader, and redeemer of chance did I teach them to create the future, and all that hath been, to redeem by creating. The past of men to redeem, and every it was, to transform, until the will saith, But so did I will it, so shall I will it. This did I call redemption, this alone taught I them to call redemption. Now do I await my redemption, that I may go down unto them for the last time. For once more will I go unto men, Amongst them will my sun set, in my dying I will give them my choicest gift. From the sun did I learn this, when it goeth down, the exuberant one, gold doth it then pour into the sea, out of inexhaustible riches, so that the poorest fisherman roweth even with golden oars. For this did I once see, and did not tire of weeping in beholding it. Like the sun will also Zarathustra go down, now sitting he here, and waiteth. Old broken tables around him, and also new tables, half written. 4. Behold, here is a new table. 
But where are my brethren who will carry it with me to the valley, and into the hearts of flesh? Thus demandeth my great love to the remotest ones. Be not considerate of thy neighbour. Man is something that must be surpassed. There are many diverse ways and modes of surpassing. See thou thereto. But only a buffoon thinketh. Man can also be overlapped. Surpass thyself even in thy neighbour. And a right which thou canst seize upon, shalt thou not allow to be given thee. What thou doest can no one do to thee again. Lo, there is no requital. He who cannot command himself shall obey. And many a one can command himself, but sorely lacketh self-obedience. 5. Thus wisheth the type of noble souls. They desire to have nothing gratuitously, least of all life. He who is of the populace wisheth to live gratuitously. We others, however, to whom life hath given itself, we are ever considering what we can best give in return. And verily, it is a noble dictum which saith, What life promiseth us? That promise will we keep to life. One should not wish enjoyment where one doth not contribute to the enjoyment. And one should not wish to enjoy. For enjoyment and innocence are the most bashful things, neither likes to be sought for. One should have them, but one should rather seek for guilt and pain. 6. O oh, my brethren, he who is the firstling is ever sacrificed. Now, however, we are firstlings. We all bleed on secret sacrificial altars. We all burn and broil in honour of ancient idols. Our best is still young. This exciteth old palates. Our flesh is tender, our skin is only lamb's skin. How could we not excite old idol priests? In ourselves dwelleth he still, the old idol priest who broileth our best for his banquet. Ah, my brethren, how could firstlings fail to be sacrifices? But so wisheth our type, and I love those who do not wish to preserve themselves, the down-going ones do I love with mine entire love, for they go beyond. 7. To be true, that can few be, and he who can will not. Least of all, however, can the good be true. O oh, these good ones! Good men never speak the truth, for the spirit thus to be good is a malady. They yield, those good ones, they submit themselves. Their heart repeateth, their soul obeyeth. He, however, who obeyeth, doth not listen to himself. All that is called evil by the good must come together in order that one truth may be born. O oh, my brethren, are ye also evil enough for this truth? The daring adventure, the prolonged distrust, the cruel nay, the tedium, the cutting into the quick, how seldom do these come together? Out of such seed, however, is truth produced. Beside the bad conscience hath hitherto grown all knowledge. Break up, break up, ye discerning ones, the old tables. 8. When the water hath planks, when gangways and railings o'erspan the stream, Verily, he is not believed who saith, All is in flux. But even the simpletons contradict him. What? say the simpletons. All is in flux? Planks and railings are still over the stream. Over the stream all is stable. All the values of things, bridges and bearings, all good and evil, these are all stable. Cometh, however, the hard winter, the stream tamer, then learn even the wittiest distrust, and verily not only the simpletons then say, Should not everything stand still? 
fundamentally standeth everything still. That is an appropriate winter doctrine. Good cheer for an unproductive period, a great comfort for winter sleepers and fireside lodgers. Fundamentally standeth everything still. But contrary thereto preacheth the thawing wind. The thawing wind, a bullock which is no ploughing bullock, a furious bullock, a destroyer, which with angry horns breaketh the ice. The ice, however, breaketh gangways. O oh, my brethren, is not everything at present in flux? Have not all railings and gangways fallen into the water? Who would still hold on to good and evil? Woe to us! Hail to us! The thawing wind bloweth! Thus preacheth my brethren all through the streets. 9. There is an old illusion. It is called good and evil. Around soothsayers and astrologers hath hitherto revolved in orbit of this illusion. Once did one believe in soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore did one believe everything is fate, thou shalt, for thou must. Then again one did distrust all soothsayers and astrologers, and therefore one did believe everything is freedom, thou canst, for thou willest. O oh, my brethren, concerning the stars and the future, there hath hitherto only been illusion, and not knowledge, and therefore, concerning good and evil, there hath hitherto only been illusion, and not knowledge. 10. Thou shalt not rob, thou shalt not slay. Such precepts were once called holy, before them did one bow the knee and the head, and took off one's shoes. But I ask you, where hath there ever been better robbers and slayers in the world than such holy precepts? Is there not even in all life robbing and slaying? For such precepts to be called holy, was not truth itself thereby slain? Or was it a sermon of death, that called holy what contradicted and dissuaded from life. O oh, my brethren, break up, break up for me the old tables. 11. It is my sympathy with all the past that I see it is abandoned, abandoned to the favour, the spirit, and the madness of every generation that cometh, and reinterpreteth all that has been as its bridge. A great potentate might arise, an artful prodigy, who with approval and disapproval could strain and constrain all the past, until it became for him a bridge, a harbinger, a herald, and a cock-crowing. This, however, is the other danger, and mine other sympathy. He who is of the populace, his thoughts go ever back to his grandfather, and with his grandfather, however, doth time cease. Thus is all the past abandoned. For it might some day happen for the populace to become master, and drown all time in shallow waters. Therefore, O oh my brethren, a new nobility is needed, which shall be the adversary of all populace and potentate rule, and shall inscribe anew the word noble on new tables. For many noble ones are needed, and many kinds of noble ones, for a new nobility. Or, as one said in a parable, that is just divinity, that there are gods, but no god. 12. O oh, my brethren, I consecrate you and point you to a new nobility. Ye shall become procreators and cultivators and sowers of the future. Verily not to a nobility which ye could purchase like traders with traders' gold. For little worth is all that hath its price. Let it not be your honour henceforth whence ye come, but whither ye go. Your will and your feet, which seek to surpass you, let those be your new honour. Verily, not that ye have served a prince, of what account a prince is now? 
nor that ye have become a bulwark to that which standeth, that it may stand more firmly, not that your family have become courtly at courts, and that ye have learned, gay-coloured like flamingos, to stand long hours in shallow pools. Paren, for the ability to stand is the merit of courtiers, and all courtiers believe that unto blessedness after death pertaineth permission to sit. End paren. Nor even that a spirit called holy led your forefathers into promised lands, which I did not praise. For where the worst of all trees grew, the cross, in the land where there is nothing to praise. And verily, wherever this holy spirit led its knights, always in such campaigns did goats and geese and rye heads and guy heads run foremost. O my brethren, not backward shall your nobility gaze, but outward. Exiles shall ye be from all fatherlands and forefatherlands. Your children's land shall ye love. Let this love be your new nobility, the undiscovered in the remotest seas. For it do I bid your sail search and search. Unto your children shall ye make amends for being the children of your fathers. All the past shall ye thus redeem. This new table do I place over you. 13. Why should one live? All is vain. To live, that is to thrash straw. To live, that is to burn oneself and not get warm. Such ancient babbling still passeth for wisdom. Because it is old, however, and smelleth mustily, therefore it is the more honoured. Even mould ennobleth. Children might thus speak. They shun the fire, because it hath burned them. There is much childishness in the old books of wisdom. And he who ever thrasheth straw, why should he be allowed to rail at thrashing? Such a fool one would have to muzzle. Such persons sit down to the table and bring nothing with them, not even good hunger, and then do they rail, all is vain. But to eat and drink well, my brethren, is verily no vain art. Break up, break up for me the tables of the never joyous ones. 14. To the clean all things are clean, thus say the people. I, however, say unto you, to the swine, all things become swinish. Therefore preacheth the visionaries and bowed heads, paren, whose hearts are also bowed down, end paren. The world itself is a filthy monster. For these are all unclean spirits, especially those, however, who have no peace or rest unless they see the world from the backside, the back world's men. To those do I say it to the face, though it sound unpleasantly, the world resembleth man, in that it hath a backside. So much is true. There is in the world much filth. So much is true. But the world itself is not therefore a filthy monster. There is wisdom in the fact that much in the world smelleth badly, Loathing itself createth wings, and fountain divining powers. In the best there is still something to loathe, and in the best there is still something that must be surpassed. O oh, my brethren, there is much wisdom in the fact that much filth is in the world. 15. Such sayings did I hear pious backworlds men speak to their consciences, and verily without a wickedness or guile although there is nothing more guileful in the world, or more wicked. Let the world be as it is, raise not a finger against it. Let whoever will choke and stab and skin and scrape the people, raise not a finger against it, thereby we will learn to renounce the world. And thy own reason, this shalt thou thyself stifle and choke, for it is a reason of this world, Thereby wilt thou learn thyself to renounce the world. Shatter, shatter, O oh my brethren, those old tables of the pious. Tatter the maxims of the world maligners. 
16. He who learneth much unlearneth all violent cravings. That do people now whisper to one another in all the dark lanes. Wisdom wearieth, nothing is worth while, thou shalt not crave. This new table found I hanging even in the public markets. Break up for me, O my brethren, break up also that new table. The weary, O the world, put it up, and the preachers of death, and the jailer. For lo, it is also a sermon for slavery. Because they learn badly and not the best, and everything too early and everything too fast, because they ate badly, for thence hath returneth their ruined stomach. For a ruined stomach is their spirit, it persuadeth to death. For verily, my brethren, the spirit is a stomach. Life is a well of delight, but to him in whom the ruined stomach speaketh, the father of affliction, all fountains are poisoned. To discern, that is delight to the lion willed, but he who hath become weary of himself merely willed, with him play all the waves. And such is always the nature of weak men, they lose themselves on their way. And at last asketh the weariest, Why did we ever go on the way? All is indifferent. To them soundeth it pleasant to have preached in their ears, Nothing is worth while, thou shalt not will. That, however, is a sermon for slavery. O oh, my brethren, a fresh blustering wind cometh the Zarathustra unto all way-weary ones. Many noses will he yet make sneeze. Even through wolves bloweth my free breath, and into prisons and imprisoned spirits. Willing emancipateth, for willing is creating, so do I teach and only for creating shall ye learn. And also learning shall ye learn only from me, the learning well. He who hath ears, let him hear. 17. There standeth the boat, thither it go over, perhaps into a vast nothingness. But who willeth enter into this perhaps? None of you want to enter into the death-boat. How should ye then be world-weary ones? World-weary ones. And have not even withdrawn from the earth. Eager did I find you for the earth, amorous still for your own world-weariness. Not in vain doth your lip hang down, a small worldly wish still sit thereon, and in your eye. Floateth there not a cloudlet, of unforgotten earthly bliss. There are on earth many good inventions, some useful, some pleasant, for their sake is the earth to be loved. And many such good inventions there are, that they are like women's breasts, useful at the same time, and pleasant. Ye world-weary ones, however, ye earth-idlers, you shall one beat with stripes, with stripes shall one again make you sprightly limbs. For if ye not be invalids, or decrepit creatures, of whom the earth is weary, then ye are sly sloths, or dainty, sneaking pleasure cats. And if ye will not again run gaily, then shall ye pass away. To the incurable shall one not seek to be a physician, thus teacheth the Zarathustra, so shall ye pass away. But more courage is needed to make an end than to make new verse, that do all physicians and poets know well. 18. O oh, my brethren, there are tables which weariness framed, and tables which slothfulness framed, corrupt slothfulness. Although they speak similarly, they want to be heard differently. See this languishing one, only a span breadth is he from his goal, but from weariness hath he lain down obstinately in the dust, this brave one. From weariness yawneth he at the path, at the earth, at the goal, and at himself. Not a step further will he go, this brave one. 
Now goeth the sun upon him, and the dogs lick at his sweat, but he lieth there in his obstinacy, and prefereth to languish, a span breadth from his goal to languish. Verily, ye will have to drag him into his heaven by the hair of his head, this hero. Better still that ye let him lie where he hath lain down, that sleep may come unto him, the comforter, with cool pattering rain. Let him lie, until of his own accord he awakeneth, until his own accord he repudiate all weariness, and what weariness hath taught through him. Only, my brethren, see that ye scare the dogs away from him, the idle skulkers, and all swarming vermin. All the swarming vermin of the cultured, that feast on the sweat of every hero. 19. I form circles around me in holy boundaries. Ever fewer ascend with me ever higher mountains. I build mountain ranges out of ever holier mountains. But wherever ye would ascend with me, O my brethren, take care lest a parasite ascend with you. A parasite, that is a reptile, a creeping, cringing reptile, that trieth to fatten on your infirm and sore places. And this is its art. It divineth where ascending souls weary. In your trouble and dejection, in your sensitive modesty, doth it build its loathsome nest. Where the strong are weak, where the noble are all too gentle, there buildeth its loathsome nest, the parasite liveth, where the great have small sore places. Where is the highest of all species of being, and what is the lowest? The parasite is the lowest species. He, however, who is of the highest species, feedeth most parasites. For the soul which hath the longest ladder, and can go deepest down, how could there fail to be the most parasites upon it? The most comprehensive soul, which can run and stray, and rove furthest in itself, the most necessary soul, which out of joy flingeth itself into chance, the soul in being, which plungeth into becoming, the possessing soul, which seeketh to attain desire and longing, the soul fleeth from itself, from overtaking itself in the widest circuit, the wisest soul, unto which fully speaketh most sweetly, the soul most self-loving, in which all things have their current and counter-current, their ebb and their flow. Oh, how could the loftiest soul fail to have the worst parasites? 20. O oh, my brethren, am I then cruel? But I say, what falleth, that shall one also push. Everything of today, it falleth, it decayeth. Who would preserve it? But I, I wish also to push it. Know ye the delight which rolleth stones into precipitous depths? Those men of today, just see how they roll into my depths. A prelude am I to better players, O oh my brethren, an example. Do according to my example. And him who ye do not teach to fly, teach, I pray you, to fall faster. 21. I love the brave, but it is not enough to be a swordsman. One must also know whereon to use swordsmanship. And often it is greater bravery to keep quiet and pass by, than thereby one may reserve oneself for a worthier foe. You shall only have foes to be hated, but not foes to be despised. You must be proud of your foes, thus I have already taught. For the worthy foe, O oh my brethren, ye shall reserve yourselves. Therefore must ye pass by many a one, especially many of the rabble, who din your ears with noise about people and peoples. Keep your eye clear of their for and against. There is there much right, much wrong, he you look upon become wroth. They're in viewing, they're in viewing, they are the same thing. Therefore depart into the forests, and lay your sword to sleep. 
go your ways, and let the people and peoples go theirs, gloomy ways, verily, on which not a single hope glinteth any more. Let there the trader rule, where all that still glittereth is, trade is gold. It is the time of kings no longer. That which now calleth itself the people is unworthy of kings. See how these people themselves now do just like the traders. They pick up the smallest advantage out of all kinds of rubbish. They lay lures for one another. They lure things out of one another. That they call good neighborliness. O oh, blessed remote period, when a people said to itself, I will be master over peoples. For my brethren, the best to rule, the best also willeth to rule. And where the teaching is different, there the best is lacking. 22. If they had bread for nothing, alas, for what would they cry? their maintainment, that is their true entertainment, and they shall have it hard. Beasts of prey are they, in their working, there is even plundering, in their earning, there is even overreaching, therefore they shall have it hard. Better beasts of prey shall they become, subtler, cleverer, more man-like, for man is the best beast of prey. All the animals hath man already robbed of their virtues. That is why, of all animals, it hath been hardest for man. Only the birds are still beyond him. And if man should yet learn to fly, alas, to what height would his rapacity fly? 23. Thus would I have man and woman fit for war the one, fit for modernity the other, both, however, fit for dancing with head and legs. And lost be the day to us in which a measure hath not been danced, and false be every truth which hath not laughter along with it. 24. Your marriage arranging, see that it be not a bad arranging, ye have arranged too hastily, so there followeth therefrom marriage breaking, and better marriage breaking than marriage bending, marriage lying. Thus spake a woman unto me, indeed I broke the marriage, but first did the marriage break me. The badly paired found I ever the most vengeful, they make every one suffer for it, that they no longer run singly. On that account I want the honest ones to say to one another, We love each other, let us see to it that we maintain our love. Or shall our pledging be blundering? Give us a set term and a small marriage, that we may see if we are fit for the great marriage. It is a great matter always to be twain, Thus do I counsel all the honest ones. And what would be my love to the superman, and all that is to come, if I should counsel and speak otherwise? Not only to propagate yourselves onwards, but upwards. There too, O oh my brethren, may the garden of marriage help you. 25. He who hath grown wise concerning old origins, lo, he will at last seek after the fountains of the future and new origins. O oh, my brethren, not long will it be until new peoples shall arise and new fountains shall rush down into new depths. For the earthquake, it choketh up many wells, it causeth much languishing, but it bringeth also to new light inner powers and secrets. The earthquake discovereth new fountains. In the earthquake of old peoples, new fountains burst forth. And whoever calleth out, Lo, here is a well for many thirsty ones, one heart for many longing ones, one will for many instruments. Around him collecteth a people, that is to say, many attempting ones. Who can command? 
who must obey. That is there attempted. Ah, with what long seeking and solving, and failing and learning and reattempting. Human society, it is an attempt, so I teach, a long seeking. It seeketh, however, the ruler. An attempt, my brethren, and no contract. Destroy, I pray you, destroy that word of the soft-hearted and the half and half. 26. O my brethren, with whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole of human future? Is it not with the good and just? And those who say and feel in their hearts, We already know what is good and just, we possess it also. Woe to those who still seek it thereafter. And whatever harm the wicked may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. And whatever harm the world maligners may do, the harm of the good is the harmfulest harm. O oh, my brethren, into the hearts of the good and just looked some one once on a time, who said, They are the Pharisees. But people did not understand him. The good and just themselves were not free to understand him. Their spirit was imprisoned in their good conscience. Their stupidity of the good is unfathomably wise. It is the truth, however, that the good must be Pharisees. They have no choice. The good must crucify him who deviseth his own virtue. That is the truth. The second one, however, who discovereth their country, the country, heart, and soul of the good and just, it is he who asked, Whom do they hate most? The Creator hate they most. Him who breaketh the tables and old values, the breaker. Him they call the lawbreaker. For the good, they cannot create. They are always the beginning of the end. They crucify him who writeth new values on new tables. They crucify unto themselves the future. They crucify the whole human future. The good. They have always been the beginning of the end. 27. O oh, my brethren, have ye also understood this word? And what I once said of the last man? With whom lieth the greatest danger to the whole human future? Is it not with the good and just? Break up, break up, I pray you, the good and just. O oh, my brethren, have ye understood also this word? 28. Ye flee from me. Ye are frightened? Ye tremble at this word? O my brethren, when I enjoined you to break up the good, and the tables of the good, then only did I embark man on his high seas, and now only cometh unto him the great terror, the great outlook, the great sickness, the great nausea, the great seasickness. False shores and false securities did the good teach you. In the lies of the good were ye born and bred. Everything hath been radically contorted and distorted by the good. But he who discovereth the country of man, discovered also the country of man's future. Now shall ye be sailors for me, brave, patient. Keep yourselves up betimes, my brethren. Learn to keep yourselves up. The sea stormeth. Many seek to raise themselves against you. The sea stormeth, all is in the sea. Well, cheer up, ye all seamen hearts. What of the fatherland? Thither striveth our helm, where our children's land is. Thitherwards, stormier than the sea, stormeth our great longing. 29. Why so hard? said to the diamond one day the charcoal. Are we then not near relatives? Why so soft, O oh my brethren? Thus do I ask you. Are you not my brethren? Why so soft, so submissive, and yielding? Why is there so much negation and abnegation in your hearts? 
why is there so little fate in your looks? And if ye will not be fates and inexorable ones, how can ye one day conquer with me? And if your hardness will not glance and cut and chip to pieces, how can ye one day create with me? For the creators are hard, and blessedness must it seem to you to press your hand upon millenniums as upon wax, blessedness to write upon the will of millenniums as upon brass, harder than brass, nobler than brass, entirely hard is only the noblest. This new table, O oh my brethren, are put over you. Become hard. 30. O oh thou, my will, thou change of every need, my needfulness, preserve me from all small victories. Thou fatest my soul, which I call fate, thou in me, over me, Preserve and spare me for one great fate. And thy last greatness, my will, spare it for thy last, that thou mayest be inexorable in thy victory. Ah, who had not succumbed to his victory? Ah, whose eye had not bedimmed in this intoxicating twilight? Ah, whose foot hath not faltered and forgotten in victory? How to stand? that I may one day be ready and ripe for one great noontide, ready and ripe like the glowing ore, the lightning-bearing cloud, the swelling milk udder, ready for myself and for my most hidden will, a bow eager for its arrow, an arrow eager for its star, a star ready and ripe in its noontide, glowing, pierced, Blessed by annihilating sun arrows, a sun itself, and an inexorable sun will, ready for annihilation in victory. O will, thou change of every need, my needfulness, spare me for one great victory. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part three. Chapter 56 Old and New Tables Read and recorded by Tim Sherman Chase in April 2008Part 3, Chapter 57 The Convalescent 1. One morning, not long after his return to his cave, Zarathustra sprang up from his couch like a madman, crying in with a frightful voice, and acting as if someone still lay on the couch, who did not wish to arise. Zarathustra's voice also resounded in such a manner that his animals came to him frightened, and out of all the neighbouring caves and lurking places all the creatures slipped away, flying, fluttering, creeping or leaping, according to their variety of foot or wing. Zarathustra, however, spake these words, Up! Abysmal thought, out of my depth! I am thy cock and morning dawn, thou overslept reptile! Up! Up! My voice shall soon crow thee awake! Unbind the fetters of thine ears. Listen, for I wish to hear thee. Up, up! There is thunder enough to make the very graves listen. And rub the sleep and all the dimness and blindness out of thine eyes. Hear me also with thine eyes. My voice is a medicine even for those born blind. And once thou art awake, then shalt thou ever remain awake. It is not my custom to awake great-grandmothers out of their sleep, that I may bid them sleep on. Thou stirrest, stretchest thyself, wheezest, up, up, not wheeze shalt thou, but speak unto me, Zarathustra calleth thee, Zarathustra the godless, 
I, Zarathustra, the advocate of the living, the advocate of the suffering, the advocate of the circuit, thee do I call, my most abysmal thought, joy to me, thou comest, I hear thee. Mine abyss speaketh, my lowest depth have I turned over into the light. Joy to me, come hither, give me thy hand. Ah, let be, aha, disgust, 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 alas to me. 2. Hardly, however, had Zarathustra spoken these words when he fell down as one dead, and remained long as one dead. When, however, he came again to himself, then he was pale and trembling, and remained lying, and for long he would neither eat nor drink. This condition continued for seven days. His animals, however, did not leave him day or night, except that the eagle flew forth to fetch food. And when it fetched and foraged, it laid on Zarathustra's touch, so that Zarathustra at last lay among yellow and red berries, grapes, rosy apples, sweet-smelling herbage, and pine cones. At his feet, however, two lambs were stretched, which the eagle had with difficulty carried off from their shepherds. At last, after seven days, Zarathustra raised himself upon his couch, took a rosy apple in his hand, smelt it, and found its smell pleasant. Then did his animals think the time had come to speak unto him. O Zarathustra, said they, now hast thou lain thus for seven days with heavy eyes. Wilt thou not set thyself again upon thy feet? Step out of thy cave, the world waiteth for thee as a garden. The wind playeth with heavy fragrance which seeketh for thee, and all brooks would like to run after thee. All things long for thee, since thou hast remained alone for seven days, step forth out of thy cave. All things want to be thy physicians. Did perhaps a new knowledge come to thee, a bitter, grievous knowledge? Like leaven dough layest thou, thy soul arose, and swelled beyond all its bounds. O oh, mine animals, answered Zarathustra, talk on thus, and let me listen. It refresheth me so to hear you talk. Where there is talk, there is the world as a garden unto me. How charming it is that there are words and tones! Are not words and tones rainbows and seeming bridges twixt the eternal separated? To each soul belongeth another world, to each soul is every other soul a back world, and the most alike doth semblance deceive most delightfully, for the smallest gap is the most difficult to bridge over. For me, how could there be an outside of me? There is no outside, but this we forget on hearing tones, how delightful it is that we forget. Have not the names and tones been given unto things that man may refresh himself with them? It is the beautiful folly speaking, therewith danceth man over everything. How lovely is all speech and all falsehoods of tones! With tones danceth our love on variegated rainbows. O Zarathustra, then said his animals, to those who think like us, things all dance themselves. They come and hold out the hand, and laugh, and flee, and return. Everything goeth, everything returneth, eternally rolleth the wheel of existence. Everything dieth, everything blossom forth again, eternally returneth on the year of existence. Everything breaketh, everything is integrated anew, eternally buildeth itself the same house of existence, all things separate, all things again greet one another, eternally true to itself remaineth the ringing of existence. Every moment beginneth existence, around every here rolleth a ball there. The middle is everywhere, crooked is the path of eternity. O ye wags and barrel organs, answered Zarathustra, and smiled once more. How well do ye know what had to be fulfilled in seven days? 
and how that monster crept into my throat and choked me. But I bit off its head and spat it away from me. And ye, ye have made a lyre lay out of it. Now, however, do I lie here, still exhausted with that biting and spitting away, still sick with my own salvation. And ye looked on at it all? All mine animals, are ye also cruel? Did ye like to look upon my great pain as men do? For man is the cruelest animal. At tragedies, bullfights and crucifixions hath he hitherto been happiest on earth. And when he invented his hell, behold, that was his heaven on earth. When the great man crieth, immediately runneth the little man thither, and his tongue hangeth out of his mouth for very lusting. He, however, call it his pity. The little man, especially the poet, how passionately doth he accuse life in words, hearken to him. But do not fail to hear the delight which is in all accusation, such accusers of life, them life overcometh with a glance of the eye. Thou lovest me, said the insolent one. Wait a little, as yet have I no time for thee. Towards himself man is the cruelest animal, and in all who call themselves sinner, and bearers of the cross, and penitents, do not overlook the voluptuousness of their plaints and accusations. And I myself, do I thereby want to be man's accuser? Ah, mine animals, this only have I learned hitherto, that for man his baddest is necessary for his best, that all that is baddest is his best power, and the hardest stone for the highest creator, and that man must become better and badder. Not to this torture stake was I tied, that I know man is bad. But I cried, as no one hath yet cried, Ah, that his badness is so very small, Ah, that his best is so very small. The great disgust at man, it strangled me, and had crept into my throat, and what the soothsayer had presaged, all is alike, nothing is worth while, knowledge strangleth. A long twilight limped on before me, a fatal weary, a fatal intoxicated sadness, which spake with yawned mouth. Eternally he returneth, the man of whom thou art weary, the small man. So yawned my sadness, and dragged its foot, and could not go to sleep. A cavern became the human earth to me, its breast caved in. Everything living became to me human dust and bones, and a mouldering past. My sighing sat on all human graves, and could no longer arise. My sighing and questioning croaked, and choked, and gnawed, and nagged day and night. Ah! Man returneth eternally, the small man returneth eternally. Naked had I once seen both of them, the great man and the small man, all too like one another, all too human, even the greatest man, all too small, even the greatest man, that was my disgust at man, and the eternal return also of the smallest man, that was my disgust at all existence. Ah, disgust, disgust, disgust! Thus begged Zarathustra, and sighed and shuddered, for he remembered his sickness. Then did his animals prevent him from speaking further. Do not speak further, thou convalescent, so answered his animals. But do go out, where the world waiteth for thee like a garden. Go out unto the roses, the bees, and the flocks of doves, especially, however, unto the singing birds, to learn singing from them. For singing is for the convalescent, the sound ones may talk. And when the sounds also want songs, then want they other songs than the convalescent. O ye wags and barrel organs, do be silent, answered Zarathustra, and smiled at his animals. How well ye know what consolation I devised for myself in seven days. 
that I have to sing once more, that consolation did I devise for myself, and this convalescence, would ye also make another lyre lay thereof? Do not talk further, answered his animals once more. Rather thou convalescent, prepare for thyself a first a lyre, a new lyre. For behold, O Zarathustra, for thy new lays there are needed new lyres. Sing and bubble over, O Zarathustra, heal thy soul with new lays, that thou mayest bear a great fate, which hath not yet been any one's fate. For thine animals know it well, O Zarathustra, who thou art, and must become. Behold, thou art the teacher of the eternal return, that is now thy fate. That thou must be the first to teach this teaching, how could this great fate not be the greatest danger and infirmity? Behold, we know what thou teachest, that all things eternally return, and ourselves with them, and that we have already existed times without number, and all things with us. Thou teachest that there is a great year of becoming, a prodigy of a great year, it must, like sand glass, ever turn up anew, that it may anew run down and run out, so that all those years are like one another in the greatest and also in the smallest, so that we ourselves in every great year are like ourselves in the greatest and also in the smallest. And if thou wouldst now die, O Zarathustra, behold, we know also how thou wouldst then speak to thyself, but thine animals besiege thee not to die yet. Thou wouldst speak, and without trembling, buoyant rather with bliss. For a great weight and worry would be taken from thee, thou patientest one. Now do I die and disappear, would thou say? And in a moment I am nothing. Souls are as mortal as bodies. But the plexus of causes returneth, in which I am intertwined. It will again create me. I myself pertain to causes of the eternal return. I come again with this sun, with this earth, with this eagle, with this serpent, not to a new life, or a better life, or a similar life. I come again eternally to this identical and self-same life, in its greatest and its smallest, to teach again the eternal return of all things, to speak again the word of that great noontide of earth and man, to announce again to man the superman. I have spoken my word, I break down by my word, so willeth mine eternal fate, as announcer do I succumb. The hour hath now come for the great down-goer to bless himself. Thus endeth Zarathustra's down-going. When the animals had spoken these words, they were silent and waited. So Zarathustra might say something to them. But Zarathustra did not hear that they were silent. On the contrary, he lay quietly with closed eyes like a person sleeping although he did not sleep, for he communed just then with his soul. The serpent, however, and the eagle, when they found him silent in such wise, respected the great stillness around him, and prudently retired. End of Part 3 Chapter 57 The Convalescent Read and recorded by Tim Shearman Chase In April 2008This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 3, Chapter 58 The Great Longing O oh my soul, I have taught thee to say today as once on a time and formerly and to dance thy measure over every here and there and yonder. O oh, my soul, I delivered thee from all by-places, I brushed down from thee dust and spiders and twilight. 
O oh my soul, I wash the petty shame and the by-place virtue from thee, and persuaded thee to stand naked before the eyes of the sun. With the storm that is called spirit, did I blow over thy surging sea. All clouds did I blow away from it. I strangled even the strangler called sin. O oh my soul, I gave thee the right to say nay like the storm, and to say yea as the open heaven saith yea. Calm as the light remainest thou, and thou walkest through denying storms. O oh my soul, I restore to thee liberty over the created and the uncreated, and who knoweth, as thou knowest, the voluptuousness of the future? O oh my soul, I taught thee the contempt which doth not come like worm-eating, the great, the loving contempt, which loveth most when it contempteth most. O oh my soul, I taught thee so to persuade that thou persuadeth even the grounds themselves to thee like the sun, which persuadeth even the sea to its height. O my soul, I have taken from thee all obeying and knee-bending and homage-paying. I have myself given thee the names, change of need, and fate. O my soul, I have given thee new names and gay-coloured playthings. I have called thee fate, and the circuit of circuits, and the navel string of time, and the azure bell. O my soul, to thy domain gave I all wisdom to drink, all new wines, and also all immemorially old strong wines of wisdom. O my soul, every sun shed I upon thee, and every night and every silence and every longing, then grewest thou up for me as a vine. O oh my soul, exuberant and heavy dost thou now stand forth, a vine with swelling udders, and full clusters of brown golden grapes, filled and weighed by thy happiness, waiting for superabundance, and yet ashamed of thy waiting. O oh my soul, there is nowhere a soul which could be more loving and more comprehensive and more extensive. Where could future and past be closer together than with thee? O my soul, I have given thee everything, and all my hands have become empty by thee, and now, now sayest thou to me, smiling and full of melancholy, which of us oweth thanks? Doth the giver not owe thanks because the receiver received? Is bestowing not a necessity? Is receiving not pitying? O oh my soul, I understand the smiling of thy melancholy. Thy overabundance itself now stretches out longing hands. Thy fullness looketh forth over raging seas, and seeketh and waiteth. The longing of overfullness looketh forth from the smiling heaven of thine eyes. And verily, O oh my soul, who could see thy smiling and not melt into tears? The angels themselves melt into tears through the over-graciousness of thy smiling. Thy graciousness and over-graciousness is it which will not complain and weep? And yet, O oh my soul, longeth thy smiling for tears, and thy trembling mouth for sobs. Is not all weeping complaining, and all complaining accusing? Thus spakest thou to thyself, and therefore, O my soul, wilt thou rather smile than pour forth thy grief? Then in gushing tears pour forth all thy grief concerning thy fullness, and concerning the craving of the vine for the vintager and the vintage knife. But wilt thou not weep? Wilt thou not weep forth thy purple melancholy? Then wilt thou have to sing, O my soul, Behold, I smile myself, who foretell thee this. Thou wilt have to sing with passionate song, until all seas turn calm into hearkening unto thy longing. Until over calm longing seas the bark glideth, the golden marvel, 
around the gold of which all good, bad, and marvellous things frisk. Also many large and small animals, and everything that hath light marvellous feet, so that it can run on violet-blue paths. Towards the golden marvel, the spontaneous bark, and its master, he, however, is the vintager who waiteth with the diamond vintage knife, thy great deliverer, O my soul, the nameless one, for whom the future songs only will find names, and verily, already hath thy breath the fragrance of future songs, already glowest thou and dreamest, already drinkest thou thirstily at all deep echoing wells of consolation, already reposeth thy melancholy at the bliss of future songs. O my soul, now have I given thee all, and even my last possession, and all my hands have become empty by thee, that I bade thee sing. Behold, that was my last thing to give, that I bade thee sing. Say now, say, which of us now oweth thanks? Better still, however, sing unto me, sing, O my soul, and let me thank thee. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part three, chapter fifty eight, The Great Longing. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3. Chapter 59. The Second Dance Song. 1. Into thine eyes gazed I lately, O life! Gold saw I gleam in thy night eyes, my heart stood still with delight. A gold bark saw I gleam on darkened waters, a sinking, drinking, reblinking, golden swing bark. At my dance frantic foot doth thou cast a glance, a laughing, questioning, melting, thrown glance. Twice only movest thou rattle with thy little hand. Then did my feet swing with dance fury. My heels reared aloft, my toes they hearkened. Thee they would know, hath not the dancer his ear in his toe? Into thee did I spring, thou fledst thou back from my bound and towards me waving thy fleeing, flying tresses around. Away from thee did I spring, and from thy snaky tresses then stood thou there half turned, and in thine eye caresses. With crooked glances dost thou teach me crooked courses, on crooked courses learn my feet crafty fancies. I fear thee near, I love thee far, thy flight allureth me, thy seeking secureth me, I suffer, but for thee what would I not gladly bear? For thee, whose coldness inflameth, whose hatred misleadeth, whose flight enchaineth, whose mockery pleadeth. Who would not hate thee, thou great bindress, in windress, temptress, secress, Fine dress, who would not love thee, thou innocent, impatient, wind-swift, child-eyed sinner? Whither pullest thou me now, thou paragon and tomboy, and now foolest thou my fleeing, thou sweet romp dost annoy? I dance after thee, I follow even faint traces lonely. Where art thou? Give me thy hand or thy finger only. Here are caves and thickets, we shall go astray, halt, stand still. Seest thou not owls and bats in the fluttering fray? Thou bat, thou owl, wouldst thou play me foul? Where are we? From the dogs hast thou learned thus to bark and howl. Thou gnashest on me sweetly, with little white teeth, 
thine evil eye shooteth out upon me, thy curly little mane from underneath. This is thy dance over stock and stone, I am the hunter. Wilt thou be my hound, or my chamois anon? Now beside me, and quickly, wickedly springing, now up, and over, alas, have I fallen over myself, over swinging. Oh, see me lying, thou arrogant one, and imploring grace. Gladly would I walk with thee, in some lovelier place, in the paths of love, through bushes variegated, quiet, trim, or there along the lake, where gold fishes dance and swim. Art thou now weary? There above are sheep and sunset strips. Is it not sweet to sleep, the shepherd pipes? Thou art so very weary? I'll carry thee thither. Let just thine arm sink. And art thou thirsty? I should have something. But thy mouth would not like it to drink. Oh, that cursed, nimble, supple serpent and lurking witch! Where art thou gone? But in my face do I feel through thy hand two spots and red blotches of itch. I am verily weary of it, ever thy sheepish shepherd to be, thou witch, if I have hitherto sung unto thee, now shalt thou cry unto me. To the rhythm of my whip shalt thou dance and cry. I forget not my whip, not I. 2. Then did life answer me thus, and thereby kept her fine ears closed. O Zarathustra, crack not so terribly with thy whip. Thou knowest surely that noise killeth thought. And just now there came to me such delicate thoughts. We are both of us genuine ne'er-do-wells and ne'er-do-ills. Beyond good and evil found we are our island and our green meadow, we two alone. Therefore must we be friendly to each other. And even should we not love each other from the bottom of our hearts, must we then have a grudge against each other if we do not love each other perfectly? And that I am friendly to thee, and often too friendly, that knowest thou. And the reason that I am envious of thy wisdom, ah, this mad old fool wisdom, if thy wisdom should one day run away from thee, ah, then also would my love run away from thee quickly. Thereupon did life look thoughtfully behind and around, and said softly, O Zarathustra, thou art not faithful enough to me. Thou lovest me not nearly so much as thou sayest. I know thou thinkest of soon leaving me. There is an old heavy, heavy booming clock. It boometh by night up to thy cave. When thou hearest this clock strike the hours at midnight, then thinkest thou between one and twelve thereon. Thou thinkest thereon, O Zarathustra, I know it, of soon leaving me. Yea, answered I, hesitatingly, but thou knowest it also. And I said something into her ear, in amongst her confused yellow foolish tresses. Thou knowest that, O Zarathustra? That knoweth no one. And we gazed at each other, and looked at the green meadow o'er which the cool evening was just passing, and we wept together. Then, however, was life dearer unto me than all my wisdom had ever been. Thus spake Zarathustra. 3. 1. O man, take heed. 2. What saith deep midnight's voice indeed? Three, I slept my sleep. Four, from the deepest dream I woke and plead. Five, the world is deep. Six, and deeper than the day could read. Seven, deep is its woe. Eight, joy, deeper still than grief can be. 
9. Woe saith, hence go. 10. But all joys want eternity. 11. Want deep, profound eternity. 12. End of part 3, chapter 59, the second dance song. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 3, Chapter 60. The Seven Seals. Paren, or the Yea and Amen Lay. End Paren. 1. If I be a diviner, and full of the divining spirit which wandereth on high mountain ridges, twixt two seas, wandereth twixt the past and the future as a heavy cloud, hostile to sultry plains, and to all that is weary and can neither die nor live, ready for lightning in its dark bosom, and for the redeeming flash of light, charged with lightnings which say yea, which laugh yea, ready for the divining flashes of lightning. Blessed, however, is he who is thus charged, and verily long must he hang like a tempest on the mountain, who shall one day kindle the light of the future. Oh, how can I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. 2. If ever my wrath hath burst graves, shifted landmarks, or rolled old shattered tables into precipitous depths, if ever my scorn hath scattered mouldering words to the winds, and if I have come like a besom to cross spiders, and as a cleansing wind to old charnel houses, if ever I have sat rejoicing where old gods lie buried, world blessing, world loving, beside the monuments of the old world maligners, for even churches and god graves do I love, if only heaven looketh through their ruined roofs with pure eyes, Gladly do I sit like grass and red poppies on ruined churches. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. 3. If ever a breath hath come to me of the creative breath, and of the heavenly necessity which compelleth even chances to dance star dances, if ever I have laughed with the laughter of the creative lightning, to which the long thunder of the deed followeth, grumbling but obediently, if ever I have played dice with the gods at the divine table of the earth, so that the earth quaked and ruptured and snorted forth fire-streams. For a divine table is the earth, and trembling with new creative dictums and dice-casts of the gods. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity." For I love thee, O eternity. 4. If ever I have drunk a full draught of the foaming spice and confection bowl in which all things are well mixed, if ever my hand hath mingled the furthest with the nearest, fire with spirit, joy with sorrow, and the harshest with the kindest, if I myself am a grain of the saving salt which make everything in the confection bowl mix well, for there is a salt that uniteth good with evil, and even the most evil is worthy, as spicing and as final over-foaming. Oh, how can I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love, 
For I love thee, O eternity, for I love thee, O eternity. 5. And if I be fond of the sea, and all that is sea-like, and fondest of it when it angrily contradicteth me, if the exploring delight be in me, which impelleth sails to the undiscovered, if the seafarer's delight be in my delight, if ever my rejoicing hath called out, the shore hath vanished, now hath fallen from me the last chain, the boundless roareth around me, far away sparkle for me space and time, well, cheer up, old heart! Oh, how can I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the returns? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman, whom I love, for I love thee, O eternity, for I love thee, O eternity. 6. If my virtue be a dancer's virtue, and if I have often sprung with both feet into golden emerald rapture, if my wickedness be a laughing wickedness, at home among rose-banks and hedges of lilies, for in laughter is all evil present, but it is sanctified and absolved by its own bliss. And if it be my Alpha and Omega that everything heavy shall become light, every body a dancer, and every spirit a bird, and verily, that is my Alpha and Omega. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love. For I love thee, O eternity. For I love thee, O eternity. 7. If ever I have spread out a tranquil heaven above me, and have flown into my own heaven with mine own pinions, if I have swum playfully in profound luminous distances, and if my freedom's avian wisdom hath come to me, thus, however, speaketh avian wisdom. Lo, there is no above and no below. Throw thyself about, outward, backward, thou light one. Sing, speak no more. Are not all words made for the heavy? Do not all words lie to the light ones? Sing, speak no more. Oh, how could I not be ardent for eternity, and for the marriage ring of rings, the ring of the return? Never yet have I found the woman by whom I should like to have children, unless it be this woman whom I love, for I love thee, O eternity, for I love thee, O eternity. End of part three, chapter sixty, The Seven Seals. Read and recorded by Tim Sherman Chase, April of 2008. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Fourth and Last Part Ah, where in the world have there been greater follies than with the pitiful? And what in the world hath caused more suffering than the follies of the pitiful? Woe unto all loving ones who have not an elevation which is above their pity. Thus spake the devil unto me once on a time. Ever God hath his hell, it is his love for man. And lately did I hear him say these words. God is dead, of his pity for man hath God died. Zarathustra, Part Two, The Pitiful Chapter 61 The Honey Sacrifice 
And again passed moons and years over Zarathustra's soul, and he heeded it not. His hair, however, became white. One day, when he sat on a stone in front of his cave, and gazed calmly into the distance, one there gazeth out on the sea, and away beyond sinuous abysses. Then went his animals thoughtfully round about him, and at last set themselves in front of him. O Zarathustra, they said, gazest thou out perhaps for thy happiness? Of what account is my happiness? answered he. I have long ceased to strive any more for happiness. I strive for my work. O Zarathustra, said the animals once more, that sayest thou as one who hath overmuch of good things. Liest thou not in a sky-blue lake of happiness? Ye wags, answered Zarathustra, and smiled. How well did ye choose the simile! But ye know also that my happiness is heavy, and not like a fluid wave of water. It presseth me, and will not leave me, and is like molten pitch. Then went his animals again thoughtfully around him, and placed themselves once more in front of him. O Zarathustra, said they, it is consequently for that reason that thou thyself always becometh yellower and darker. Although thy hair looketh white and flaxen, lo, thou sittest in thy pitch. What do ye say, mine animals? said Zarathustra, laughing. Verily I reviled when I spake of pitch, as it happeneth with me. So is it with all fruits that turn ripe. It is the honey in my veins that maketh my blood thicker, and also my soul stiller. So will it be, O Zarathustra, answered his animals, and pressed up to him. But wilt thou not to-day ascend a high mountain? The air is pure, and to-day one seeth more of the world than ever. Yea, mine animals, answered he, ye counsel admirably and according to my heart. I will to-day ascend a high mountain. But see that honey is there ready to hand, yellow, white, good, ice-cool, golden comb-honey. For know that when aloft I will make the honey sacrifice. When Zarathustra, however, was aloft on the summit, he sent his animals home that had accompanied him, and found that he was now alone. Then he laughed from the bottom of his heart, looked around him, and spake thus, That I spake of sacrifices and honey sacrifices. It was merely a ruse in talking, and verily a useful folly. Here aloft can I now speak freer than in front of mountain caves and anchorites domestic animals? What to sacrifice? I squander what is given me, a squanderer with a thousand hands. How could I call that sacrificing? And when I desired honey, I only desired bait, and sweet mucus, and mucilage for which even the mouths of growling bears and strange, sulky, evil birds water. The best bait, as huntsmen and fishermen require it. For if the world be as a gloomy forest of animals, and a pleasure ground for all wild huntsmen, it seemeth to me rather, and preferably, a fathomless, rich sea, a sea full of many-hued fishes and crabs, for which even the gods might long, and might be tempted to become fishers in it, and casters of nets. So rich is the world in wonderful things, great and small. Especially the human world, the human sea. Towards it do I now throw out my golden angle-rod, and say, Open up, thou human abyss! 
open up and throw unto me thy fish and shining crabs. With my best bait shall I allure to myself to-day the strangest human fish. My happiness itself do I throw out into all places far and wide, twixt orient, noontide, and occident, to see if many human fish will not learn to hug and tug at my happiness, until, biting at my sharp hidden hooks, they have to come up unto my height, the motliest abyss groundlings to the wickedest of all fishes of men. For this am I from the heart and from the beginning, drawing, hither drawing, upward drawing, upbringing, a drawer, a trainer, a training master, who not in vain counseled myself once upon a time, become what thou art. Thus may men now come up to me, for as yet do I await the signs that it is time for my down-going, as yet do I not myself go down, as I must do amongst men. Therefore do I here wait, crafty and scornful upon high mountains, no impatient one, no patient one, rather one who hath even unlearnt patience, because he no longer suffereth. For my fate giveth me time. It hath forgotten me, perhaps? Or doth it sit behind a big stone and catch flies? And verily I am well disposed to mine eternal fate, because it doth not hound and hurry me, but leaveth me time for merriment and mischief so that I have to-day ascended this high mountain to catch fish. Did ever any one catch fish upon high mountains? And though it be a folly what I here seek and do, it is better so than that down below I should become solemn with waiting with green and yellow, a posturing wrath-snorter with waiting, a holy howl-storm from the mountains, an impatient one that shouteth down into the valleys, Hearken, else I will scourge you with the scourge of God. Not that I would have a grudge against such wrathful ones on that account. They are well enough for laughter to me. Impatient must they now be those big alarm drums which find a voice now or never. Myself, however, and my fate. We do not talk to the present. Neither do we talk to the never. For talking we have patience, and time, and more than time. For one day must it yet come, and may not pass by. What must one day come, and may not pass by? Our great Hazar, that is to say, our great remote human kingdom, the Zarathustra kingdom of a thousand years. How remote may such remoteness be? What doth it concern me? But on that account it is none the less sure unto me, with both feet stand I secure on this ground, on an eternal ground, on hard primary rock, on this highest, hardest primary mountain ridge, unto which all winds come, as unto the storm, parting, asking where and whence and whither. Here laugh, laugh, my hearty, healthy wickedness, from high mountains cast down thy glittering scorn laughter. Allure for me with thy glittering the finest human fish, and whatever belongeth unto me in all seas, my in and for me in all things. Fish that out for me. Bring that up to me, for that do I wait, the wickedest of all fish-catchers. Out, out, my fishing-hook! In and down, thou bait of my happiness, drip thy sweetest dew, thou honey of my heart. Bite, my fishing-hook, into the belly of all black affliction. Look out, look out, mine eye! Oh, how many seas round about me! What dawning human futures! And above me, what rosy red stillness! 
What unclouded silence! End Chapter 61 This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 62 The Cry of Distress The next day sat Zarathustra again on the stone in front of his cave, whilst his animals roved about in the world outside to bring home new food, also new honey for Zarathustra had spent and wasted the old honey to the very last particle. When he thus sat, however, with a stick in his hand, tracing the shadow of his figure on the earth, and reflecting, verily, not upon himself in his shadow, all at once he startled and shrank back, for he saw another shadow beside his own. And when he hastily looked around and stood up, behold, there stood the soothsayer beside him, the same whom he had once given to eat and drink at his table, the proclaimer of the great weariness, who taught, All is alike, nothing is worth while, the world is without meaning, knowledge strangleth. But his face had changed since then, and when Zarathustra looked into his eyes his heart was startled once more. So much evil announcement, and ashy grey lightnings passed over that countenance. The soothsayer, who had perceived what went on in Zarathustra's soul, wiped his face with his hands, as if he would wipe out the impression. The same did also Zarathustra. And when both of them had thus silently composed and strengthened themselves, they gave each other the hand as a token, that they wanted once more to recognize each other. "'Welcome thither,' said Zarathustra, thou soothsayer of the great weariness. Not in vain shalt thou once have been my messmate and guest. Eat and drink also with me to-day, and forgive it that a cheerful old man sitteth with thee at the table.' "'A cheerful old man,' answered the soothsayer, shaking his head. But whoever thou art, or wouldst be, O Zarathustra, thou hast been here aloft the longest time. In a little while thy bark shall no longer rest on dry land. Do I then rest on dry land? asked Zarathustra, laughing. The waves around thy mountain, answered the soothsayer, rise and rise, the waves of great distress and affliction. They will soon raise thy bark also, and carry thee away. Thereupon was Zarathustra silent, and wondered. Dost thou still hear nothing? continued the soothsayer. Doth it not rush and roar out of the depth? Zarathustra was silent once more, and listened. Then heard he a long, long cry, which the abysses threw to one another and passed on for none of them wished to retain it, so evil did it sound. Thou ill announcer, said Zarathustra at last, that is a cry of distress, and the cry of a man. It may come perhaps out of a black sea. But what doth human distress matter to me? My last sin which hath been reserved for me, knowest thou what it is called? Pity, answered the soothsayer, from an overflowing heart, and raised both his hands aloft. O oh, Zarathustra, I have come that I may seduce thee into thy last sin. And hardly had those words been uttered, when there sounded the cry once more, and longer and more alarming than before, also much nearer. Hearest thou, hearest thou, O Zarathustra, called out the soothsayer, the cry concerneth thee, it calleth thee, 
Come, 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 it is time, it is the highest time. Zarathustra was silent thereupon, confused and staggered. At last he asked, like one who hesitateth in himself, And who is it that there calleth me? But thou knowest it certainly, answered the soothsayer warmly. Why dost thou conceal thyself? It is the higher man that crieth for thee. The higher man, cried Zarathustra, horror-stricken. What wanteth he? What wanteth he, the higher man? What wanteth he here? And his skin covered with perspiration. The soothsayer, however, did not heed Zarathustra's alarm, but listened and listened in the downward direction. When, however, it had been still there for a long while, he looked behind and saw Zarathustra standing, trembling. O oh, Zarathustra, he began with sorrowful voice, thou dost not stand there like one whose happiness maketh him giddy. Thou wilt have to dance, lest thou tumble down. But although thou shouldst dance before me, and leap all thy side leaps, no one may say unto me, Behold, here danceth the last joyous man. In vain would any one come to this height who sought him here. Caves would he find indeed, and back caves, hiding places for hidden ones, but not lucky mines nor treasure chambers, nor new gold veins of happiness. Happiness! How indeed could one find happiness among such buried alive and solitary ones? Must I yet seek the last happiness on the happy isles and far away among forgotten seas? But all is alike. Nothing is worth while. No seeking is of service. There are no longer any happy isles. Thus sighed the soothsayer. With his last sigh, however, Zarathustra again became serene and assured, like one who hath come out of a deep chasm into the light. Nay, nay, three times nay, exclaimed he with a strong voice, and stroked his beard. That do I know better. There are still happy isles. Silence thereon, thou sighing sorrow sack. Cease to splash thereon, thou rain cloud of the forenoon. Do I not already stand here wet with thy misery and drenched like a dog? Now do I shake myself and run away from thee, that I may again become dry. Thereat mayest thou not wander. Do I seem to thee discourteous? Here, however, is my court. But as regards the higher man, well, I shall seek him at once in those forests. From thence came his cry. Perhaps he is there hard to beset by an evil beast. He is in my domain. Therein shall he receive no scath. And verily, there are many evil beasts around me. With those words, Zarathustra turned around to depart. Then said the soothsayer, O oh, Zarathustra, thou art a rogue! I know it well, thou wouldst fain be rid of me. Rather wouldst thou run into the forest and lay snares for evil beasts. But what good will it do thee? In the evening wilt thou have me again. In thine own cave will I sit patient and heavy like a block, and wait for thee. So be it, shouted back Zarathustra as he went away. And what is mine in my cave belongeth also unto thee, my guest. Shouldst thou, however, find honey therein, well, just lick it up, thou growling bear, and sweeten thy soul. For in the evening we want both to be in good spirits. In good spirits and joyful, because this day hath come to an end, and thou thyself shalt dance to my lays as my dancing bear. Thou dost not believe this, thou shakest thy head. Well, cheer up, old bear. But I also am a soothsayer. Thus spake Zarathustra. 
End chapter 62 This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 63 Talk with the Kings 1. Ere Zarathustra had been an hour on his way in the mountains and forests, he saw all at once a strange procession. Right on the path which he was about to descend came two kings walking, bedecked with crowns and purple girdles, and variegated like flamingos. They drove before them a laden ass. "'What do these kings want in my domain?' said Zarathustra in astonishment to his heart, and hid himself hastily behind a thicket. When, however, the kings approached to him, he said half aloud, like one speaking only to himself, Strange, strange, how doth this harmonize? Two kings do I see, and only one ass. Thereupon the two kings made a halt. They smiled and looked towards the spot whence the voice proceeded, and afterwards looked into each other's faces. "'Such things do we also think among ourselves,' said the king on the right, "'but we do not utter them.' The king on the left, however, shrugged his shoulders and answered, "'That may perhaps be a goatherd, or an anchorite, who hath lived too long among rocks and trees.' for no society at all spoileth also good manners. Good manners, replied angrily and bitterly the other king, what then do we run out of the way of? Is it not good manners, our good society? Better verily to live among anchorites and goatherds than with our gilded, false, over-rouged populace, though it call itself good society, though it call itself nobility, but there all is false and foul, above all the blood, thanks to old evil diseases and worse curers. The best and dearest to me at present is still a sound peasant, coarse, artful, obstinate, and enduring. That is at present the noblest type. The peasant is at present the best, and the peasant type should be master. But it is the kingdom of the populace. I no longer allow anything to be imposed upon me. The populace, however, that meaneth hodgepodge. Populace hodgepodge. Therein is everything mixed with everything, saint and swindler, gentleman and Jew, and every beast out of Noah's ark. Good manners. Everything is false and foul with us. No one knoweth any longer how to reverence. It is that precisely that we run away from. They are fulsome, obtrusive dogs, they gild palm leaves. This loathing choketh me, that we kings ourselves have become false, draped and disguised with the old faded pomp of our ancestors, showpieces for the stupidest, the craftiest, and whosoever at present trafficketh for power. We are not the first men, and have nevertheless to stand for them, of this imposture have we at last become weary and disgusted. From the rabble have we gone out of the way, from all those bawlers and scribe blowflies, from the traitor stench, the ambition fidgeting, the bad breath. Fie! To live among the rabble. Fie! To stand for the first men among the rabble. Ah! Loathing! 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 What doth it now matter about us, kings? Thine old sickness seizeth thee, said here the king on the left. Thy loathing seizeth thee, my poor brother. Thou knowest, however, that someone heareth us. Immediately thereupon Zarathustra, who had opened ears and eyes to this talk, rose from his hiding-place, advanced towards the kings, and thus began, He who hearkeneth unto you, he who gladly hearketh unto you is called Zarathustra. I am Zarathustra, who once said, 
what doth it now matter about kings? Forgive me, I rejoiced when ye said to each other, What doth it matter about us kings? Here, however, is my domain and jurisdiction. What may ye be seeking in my domain? Perhaps, however, ye have found on your way what I seek, namely, the higher man. When the kings heard this, they beat upon their breasts, and said with one voice, We are recognized. With the sword of thine utterance severest thou the thickest darkness of our hearts. Thou hast discovered our distress, for lo, we are on our way to find the higher man, the man that is higher than we, although we are kings. To him do we convey this as, for the highest man shall also be the highest lord on earth. There is no sorer misfortune in all human destiny than when the mighty of the earth are not also the first men. Then everything becometh false and distorted and monstrous. And when they are even the last man and more beast than man, then riseth and riseth the populace in honor. And at last saith even the populace, Virtue, lo, I alone am virtue. What have I just heard? answered Zarathustra. What wisdom in kings! I am enchanted, and verily I have already promptings to make a rhyme thereon. Even if it should happen to be a rhyme not suited for every one's ears, I unlearned long ago to have consideration for long ears. Well then, well now. Here, however, it happened that the ass also found utterance. It said distinctly, and with malevolence, Yea! T'was once, methinks, year one of our blessed Lord, Drunk without wine, the sibyl thus deplored, How ill things go, decline, decline, Ne'er sank the world so low, Rome now hath turned harlot and harlot stew, Rome's Caesar a beast, and God hath turned Jew. 2. With those rhymes of Zarathustra the kings were delighted. The king on the right, however, said, O Zarathustra, how well it was that we set out to see thee! For thine enemy showed us thy likeness in their mirror. There lookest thou with the grimace of a devil, and sneeringly, so that we were afraid of thee. But what good did it do? Always didst thou prick us anew in heart and ear with thy sayings. Then did we say at last, What doth it matter how he look? We must hear him, him who teacheth, Ye shall love peace as a means to new wars, And the short peace more than the long no one ever spake such warlike words. What is good to be brave is good. It is the good war that halloweth every cause. O oh, Zarathustra, our father's blood stirred in our veins at such words. It was like the voice of spring to old wine casks. When the swords ran among one another like red-spotted serpents, then did our fathers become fond of life, the son of every peace seemed to them languid and lukewarm. The long peace, however, made them ashamed. How they sighed, our fathers, when they saw on the wall brightly furbished, dried-up swords. Like those, they thirsted for war. For a sword thirsteth to drink blood, and sparkleth with desire. When the kings thus discoursed, and talked eagerly of their happiness of their fathers, there came upon Zarathustra no little desire to mock at their eagerness, for evidently they were very peaceable kings whom he saw before him, kings with old and refined features. But he restrained himself. Well, said he, thither leadeth the way, there lieth the cave of Zarathustra, and this day is to have a long evening. At present, however, a cry of distress calleth me hastily away from you. It will honor my cave if kings want to sit 
and wait in it. But to be sure, ye will have to wait long. Well, what of that? Where doth one at present learn better to wait than at courts? And the whole virtue of kings that hath remained unto them, is it not called to-day ability to wait? Thus spake Zarathustra. End chapter 63 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox.org recording by D. E. Whitcower. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 64 The Leech And Zarathustra went thoughtfully on, further and lower down, through forests and past moory bottoms. As it happeneth, however, to every one who meditateth upon hard matters, he trod thereby unawares upon a man. And lo, there spurted into his face all at once a cry of pain and two curses and twenty bad invectives, so that in his fright he raised his stick and also struck the trodden one. Immediately afterwards, however, he regained his composure, and his heart laughed at the folly he had just committed. Pardon me, said he to the trodden one, who had got up enraged and had seated himself. Pardon me, and hear first of all a parable. As a wanderer who dreameth of remote things on a lonesome highway runneth unawares against a sleeping dog, a dog which lieth in the sun, as both of them then start up and snap at each other like deadly enemies, those two beings mortally frightened, so did it happen unto us, and yet, and yet, how little was lacking for them to caress each other, that dog and that lonesome one. Are they not both lonesome ones? Whoever thou art, said the trodden one, still enraged, thou treadest also to nigh me with thy parable, and not only with thy foot. Lo, am I then a dog? And thereupon the sitting one got up, and pulled his naked arm out of the swamp. For at first he had lain outstretched on the ground, hidden and indiscernible, like those who lie in wait for swamp game. "'But whatever art thou about?' cried out Zarathustra, in alarm, for he saw a great deal of blood streaming over the naked arm. "'What hath hurt thee? Hath an evil beast bit thee, thou unfortunate one?' The bleeding one laughed, still angry. "'What matter is it to thee?' said he, and was about to go on. "'Here am I at home and in my province. Let him question me whoever will, to a dolt, however, I shall hardly answer.' "'Thou art mistaken,' said Zarathustra, sympathetically, and held him fast. "'Thou art mistaken. Here thou art not at home, but in my domain.' and therein shall no one receive any hurt. Call me however what thou wilt. I am who I must be. I call myself Zarathustra. Well, up thither is the way to Zarathustra's cave. It is not far. Wilt thou not attend to thy wounds at my home? It hath gone badly with thee, thou unfortunate one, in this life. First a beast bit thee, and then a man trod upon thee. When, however, the trodden one had heard the name of Zarathustra, he was transformed. What happeneth unto me? he exclaimed. Who preoccupieth me so much in this life as this one man, namely, Zarathustra, and that one animal that liveth on blood, the leech? For the sake of the leech did I lie here by this swamp like a fisher and already had mine outstretched arm been bitten ten times, when there biteth a still finer leech at my blood, Zarathustra himself. O oh, happiness, O oh, miracle! Praised be this day which enticed me into the swamp. 
praised be the best, the livest cupping glass that at present liveth. Praised be the great conscience leech Zarathustra. Thus spake the trodden one, and Zarathustra rejoiced at his words and their refined reverential style. Who art thou? asked he, and gave him his hand. There is much to clear up and elucidate between us. But already methinketh pure clear day is dawning. I am the spiritually conscientious one, answered he who was asked. And in matters of the spirit, it is difficult for any one to take it more rigorously, more restrictedly, and more severely than I, except him from whom I learnt it, Zarathustra himself. Better know nothing than half know many things. Better be a fool on one's own account than a sage on other people's approbation. I go to the basis. What matter if it be great or small? if it be called swamp or sky. A hand-breadth of basis is enough for me, if it be actually basis and ground. A hand-breadth of basis, thereon can one stand. In the true knowing, knowledge there is nothing great and nothing small. Then thou art perhaps an expert on the leech, asked Zarathustra, and thou investigateth the leech to its ultimate basis, thou conscientious one? O oh, Zarathustra, answered the trodden one, that would be something immense. How could I presume to do so? That, however, of which I am master and knower is the brain of the leech. That is my world. And it is also a world, uh, forgive it, however, that my pride here findeth expression, for here I have not mine equal. Therefore, said I, here am I at home. How long have I investigated this one thing, the brain of the leech, so that here the slippery truth might no longer slip from me? Here is my domain. For the sake of this did I cast everything else aside, for the sake of this did everything else become indifferent to me. And close beside my knowledge lieth my black ignorance. My spiritual conscience requireth from me that it should be so, that I should know one thing, and not know all else. They are a loathing unto me, all the semi-spiritual, all the hazy, hovering, and visionary. Where mine honesty ceaseth, there am I blind, and want also to be blind. Where I want to know, however, there want I also to be honest, namely, severe, rigorous, restricted, cruel, and inexorable. Because thou once saidest, O Zarathustra, spirit is life which itself cutteth into life. That led and allured me to thy doctrine, and verily with mine own blood have I increased mine own knowledge. As the evidence indicateth, broke in Zarathustra, for still was the blood flowing down on the naked arm of the conscientious one, for there had ten leeches bitten into it. O oh, thou strange fellow, how much doth this very evidence teach me, namely, thou thyself. And not all, perhaps, might I pour into thy rigorous ear. Well, then, we part here, but I would fain find thee again. Up thither is the way to my cave. To-night shalt thou there be my welcome guest. Fain would I also make amends to thy body for Zarathustra treading upon thee with his feet. I think about that. Just now, however, a cry of distress calleth me hastily away from thee. Thus spake Zarathustra. End chapter 64 This recording is in the public domain.
This is a LibriVox.org recording by D. E. Whitcower. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. Chapter 65 The Magician 1. When, however, Zarathustra had gone round a rock, then saw he on the same path not far below him a man who threw his limbs about like a maniac, and at last tumbled to the ground on his belly. Halt! said then Zarathustra to his heart. He there must surely be the higher man. From him came that dreadful cry of distress. I will see if I can help him. When, however, he ran to the spot where the man lay on the ground, he found a trembling old man with fixed eyes. And in spite of all Zarathustra's efforts to lift him and set him again on his feet, it was all in vain. The unfortunate one, also, did not seem to notice that someone was beside him. On the contrary, he continually looked around with moving gestures, like one forsaken, and isolated from all the world. At last, however, after much trembling and convulsion and curling himself up, he began to lament thus. Who warmth me, who loveth me still? Give ardent fingers, give heartening charcoal warmers, prone, outstretched, trembling, like him half dead and cold, whose feet won warmth, and shaken, ah, by unfamiliar fevers, shivering with sharpened, icy, cold frost arrows, by thee pursued, my fancy, ineffable, recondite, sore frightening, thou huntsman, hind the cloud-banks, now lightning struck by thee, thou mocking eye, that me in darkness watcheth. Thus do I lie, bend myself, twist myself, convulsed with all eternal torture, and smitten by thee, cruelest huntsman, thou unfamiliar god. Smite deeper, smite yet once more, pierce through and rend my heart, what meaneth this torture with dull indented arrows? Why lookst thou hither, of human pain not weary, with mischief-loving godly flash-glances? Not murder wilt thou, but torture. Torture? For why? Me torture thou, mischief-loving, unfamiliar god. Ha! Ha! Thou stealest nigh in midnight's gloomy hour. What wilt thou? Speak! Thou crowdst me, pressest. Ha! Now far too closely, thou hearst me breathing, thou o'erhearst my heart, thou ever jealous one, of what prey ever jealous, off, off, for why the latter wouldst thou get in, to heart, in, clamber, to mine own secretest conceptions, in, clamber, shameless one, thou unknown one, thief, what seekest thou by thy stealing? What seekest thou by thy hearkening? What seekest thou by thy torturing, thou torturer, thou hangman, God? Or shall I, as the mastiffs do, roll before thee, and cringing and raptured frantical, my tail friendly waggle in vain? Goad further, cruelest goader. No dog thy game, just am I, cruelest huntsman. Thou proudest of captives, thou robber hind the cloud banks. Speak finally, thou lightning-veiled one, thou unknown one. Speak, what wilt thou, highway ambusher, from me? What wilt thou, unfamiliar god? What? Ransom gold? How much of ransom gold? Solicit much, that bit my pride, and be concise, that bit mine other pride. Ha! Ha! Me! Wants thou me entire? Ha! Ha! And torturest me. Fool that thou art dead, torturous, quite my pride. Give love to me, who warmth me still, who loveth me still. Give ardent fingers, give heartening charcoal warmers. Give me the lonesomest, the ice, ah, sevenfold frozen ice. For very enemies, for foes, doth make one thirst. Give, yield to me, cruelest foe, thyself. 
Away! There fled he surely, my final only comrade. My greatest foe, mine unfamiliar, my hangman god. Nay, come thou back, with all of thy great tortures, to me the last of lonesome ones. Oh, come thou back! All my hot tears in streamlets trickle their course to thee, and all my final hearty fervor up gloth to thee. O oh, come thou back, mine unfamiliar God, my pain, my final bliss. 2. Here, however, Zarathustra could no longer restrain himself. He took his staff and struck the wailer with all his might. Stop this, he cried to him with wrathful laughter. Stop this, thou stage-player, thou false coiner, thou liar from the very heart. I know thee well. I will soon make warm legs to thee, thou evil magician. I know well how to make it hot for such as thou. Leave off, said the old man, and sprang up from the ground. Strike me no more, O Zarathustra. I did it only for amusement. That kind of thing belongeth to mine art. Thee thyself I wanted to put to the proof when I gave this performance, and verily thou hast well detected me. But thou thyself hast given me no small proof of thyself. Thou art hard, thou wise Zarathustra. Hard strikest thou with thy truths. Thy cudgel forceth from me this truth. Flatter not, answered Zarathustra, still excited and frowning, thou stage-player from the heart. Thou art false. Why speakest thou of truth? Thou peacock of peacocks, thou sea of vanity. What didst thou represent before me, thou evil magician? Whom was I meant to believe in when thou wailedst in such wise? The penitent in spirit, said the old man. It was him I represented. Thou thyself once devisedst this expression. The poet and magician who at last turneth his spirit against himself. The transformed one who freezeth to death by his bad science and conscience. And just acknowledge it. It was long, O Zarathustra, before thou discoveredst my trick and lie. Thou believedst in my distress when thou heldest my head with both thy hands. I heard thee lament. We have loved him too little, loved him too little. Because I so far deceived thee, my wickedness rejoiced in me. Thou mayest have deceived subtler ones than I, said Zarathustra sternly. I am not on my guard against deceivers. I have to be without precaution, so willeth my lot. Thou, however, must deceive, so far do I know thee. Thou must ever be equivocal, trivocal, quadrivocal, and quinquivocal. Even what thou hast now confessed is not nearly true enough, nor false enough, for me. Thou bad false coiner, how couldst thou do otherwise? Thy very malady wouldst thou whitewash if thou showed thyself naked to thy physician. Thus didst thou whitewash thy lie before me, when thou saidst, I did so only for amusement. There was also seriousness therein, thou art something of a penitent in spirit. I divine thee well. Thou hast become the enchanter of all the world, but for thyself thou hast no lie or artifice left. Thou art disenchanted to thyself. Thou hast reaped disgust as thy one truth. No word in thee is any longer genuine, but thy mouth is so. That is to say, the disgust that cleaveth unto thy mouth. Who art thou at all? cried here the old magician with defiant voice. Who dareth to speak thus unto me, the greatest man now living? And a green flash shot from his eye at Zarathustra. But immediately after he changed, and said sadly, O oh, Zarathustra, I am weary of it. I am disgusted with mine arts. I am not great. 
why do I dissemble? But thou knowest it well, I sought for greatness. A great man I wanted to appear, and persuaded many. But the lie hath been beyond my power, on it do I collapse. O Zarathustra, everything is a lie in me. But that I collapse. This, my collapsing, is genuine. It honoureth thee, said Zarathustra gloomily, looking down with sidelong glance. It honoureth thee that thou soughtest for greatness, but it betrayeth thee also. Thou art not great. Thou bad old magician, that is the best and the honestest thing I honour in thee, that thou hast become weary of thyself, and hast expressed it. I am not great. Therein do I honour thee as a penitent in spirit. And although only for the twinkling of an eye, in that one moment wast thou genuine. But tell me, what seekest thou here in my forests and rocks? And if thou hast put thyself in my way, what proof of me wouldst thou have? Wherein? Didst thou put me to the test? Thus spake Zarathustra, and his eyes sparkled. But the old magician kept silent for a while. Then said he, Did I put thee to the test? I seek only. O oh, Zarathustra, I seek a genuine one, a right one, a simple one, an unequivocal one a man of perfect honesty, a vessel of wisdom, a saint of knowledge, a great man. Knowest thou it not of Zarathustra? I seek Zarathustra. And here there arose a long silence between them. Zarathustra, however, became profoundly absorbed in thought, so that he shut his eyes. But afterwards, coming back to the situation, he grasped the hand of the magician, and said, full of politeness and policy, Well, up thither leadeth the way. There is the cave of Zarathustra. In it mayest thou seek him, whom thou wouldst fain find. And ask counsel of mine animals, mine eagle, and my serpent. They shall help thee to seek. My cave, however, is large. I myself, to be sure, I have as yet seen no great man. That which is great, the acutest eye, is at present insensible to it. It is the kingdom of the populace. Many a one have I found who stretched and inflated himself. And the people cried, Behold, a great man! But what good do all bellows do? The wind cometh out at last. At last bursteth the frog which hath inflated itself too long. Then cometh out the wind. To prick a swollen one in the belly I call a good pastime. Hear that, ye boys? Our to-day is of the populace. Who still knoweth what is great, and what is small? Who could there seek successfully for greatness, a fool only? It succeedeth with fools. Thou seekest for great men, thou strange fool. Who taught that to thee? Is today the time for it? O oh, thou bad seeker, why dost thou tempt me? Thus spake Zarathustra, comforted in his heart and went laughing on his way. End chapter 65 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox.org recording by D. E. Whitcower. Thus spake Zarathustra, by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. 
Part 66 Out of Service Not long, however, after Zarathustra had freed himself from the magician, he again saw a person sitting beside the path which he followed, namely, a tall black man with a haggard, pale countenance. This man grieved him exceedingly. Alas, said he to his heart, there sitteth disguised affliction. Methinketh he is of the type of the priests. What do they want in my domain? What? Hardly have I escaped from that magician, and must another necromancer again run across my path? Some sorcerer with laying on of hands, some sombre wonder-worker by the grace of God, some anointed world maligner, whom may the devil take. But the devil is never at the place which would be his right place. He always cometh too late, that cursed dwarf and clubfoot. Thus cursed Zarathustra impatiently in his heart, and considered how with averted look he might slip past the black man. But behold, it came about otherwise. For at the same moment had the sitting one already perceived him, and not unlike one whom an unexpected happiness overtaketh, he sprang to his feet, and went straight toward Zarathustra. Whoever thou art, thou traveller, said he, help a strayed one, a seeker, an old man, who may here easily come to grief. The world here is strange to me and remote. Wild beasts also did I hear howling, and he who could have given me protection, he is himself no more. I was seeking the pious man, a saint, and an anchorite, who, alone in his forest, had not yet heard of what all the world knoweth at present. What doth all the world know at present? asked Zarathustra. Perhaps that the old god no longer liveth, in whom all the world once believed. Thou sayest it, answered the old man sorrowfully, and I served that old god until his last hour. Now, however, am I out of service, without master, and yet not free. Likewise am I no longer merry even for an hour, except it be in recollections. Therefore did I ascend into these mountains, that I might finally have a festival for myself once more, as becometh an old pope and church father. For know it, that I am the last pope, a festival of pious recollections and divine services. Now, however, is he himself dead, the most pious of men, a saint in the forest, who praised his God constantly with singing and mumbling. He himself found I no longer when I found his cot, but two wolves found I therein, which howled on account of his death, for all animals loved him. Then did I haste away. Had I thus come in vain into these forests and mountains, then did my heart determine that I should seek another, the most pious of all those who believe not in God. My heart determined that I should seek Zarathustra. Thus spake the hoary man, and gazed with keen eyes at him who stood before him. Zarathustra, however, seized the hand of the old pope, and regarded it a long while with admiration. Lo, thou venerable one, said he then, what a fine and long hand! That is the hand of one who hath ever dispensed blessings. Now, however, doth it hold fast him who thou seekest, me, Zarathustra. It is I, the ungodly Zarathustra, who saith, who is ungodlier than I, 
that I may enjoy his teaching. Thus spake Zarathustra, and penetrated with his glances the thoughts and arrear thoughts of the old pope. At last the latter began. He who most loved and possessed him hath now also lost him most. Lo, I myself am surely the most godless of us at present. But who could rejoice at that? Thou servest him to the last, asked Zarathustra thoughtfully, after a deep silence. Thou knowest how he died? Is it true what they say, that sympathy choked him? That he saw how man hung on the cross and could not endure it? That his love to man became his hell, and at last his death? The old pope, however, did not answer, but looked aside timidly with a painful and gloomy expression. Let him go, said Zarathustra, after prolonged meditation, still looking the old man straight in the eye. Let him go, he is gone, and though it honoureth thee that thou speakst only in praise of this dead one, yet thou knowest as well as I who he was, and that he went curious ways. To speak before three eyes, said the old pope cheerfully. He was blind of one eye. In divine matters I am more enlightened than Zarathustra himself, and may well be so. My love served him long years, my will followed all his will. A good servant, however, knoweth everything, and many a thing even which a master hideth from himself. He was a hidden god, full of secrecy. Verily, he did not come by his son otherwise than by secret ways. At the door of his faith standeth adultery. Whoever extolleth him as a god of love doth not think highly enough of love itself. Did not that god want also to be a judge? But the loving one loveth irrespective of reward and requital. When he was young, that god out of the Orient, then he was harsh and revengeful, and built himself a hell for the delight of his favorites. At last, however, he became old and soft and mellow and pitiful, more like a grandfather than a father, but most like a tottering old grandmother. There did he sit, shriveled in his chimney corner, fretting on account of his weak legs, world-weary, will-weary. And one day he suffocated of his all-too-great pity. Thou old pope, said here Zarathustra interposing, hast thou seen that with thine eyes? It could well have happened in that way, in that way and also otherwise. When gods die, they always die many kinds of death. Well, at all events, one way or the other, he is gone. He was counter to the taste of mine ears and eyes. Worse than that, I should not like to say against him. I love everything that looketh bright, and speaketh honestly. But he, thou knowest it, forsooth, thou old priest, there was something of thy type in him, the priest type. He was equivocal. He was also indistinct. How he raged at us, this wrath-snorter, because we understood him badly. But why did he not speak more clearly? And, if the fault lay in our ears, why did he give us ears that heard him badly? 
If there was dirt in our ears, well, who put it in them? Too much miscarried with him, this potter who had not learned thoroughly. That he took revenge on his pots and creations, however, because they turned out badly. That was a sin against good taste. There is also good taste in piety. This at last said, Away with such a god! Better to have no god, better to set up destiny on one's own account. Better to be a fool, better to be god oneself. What do I hear? said then the old pope, with intent ears. O oh, Zarathustra, thou art more pious than thou believest with such an unbelief. Some god in thee hath converted thee to thine ungodliness. Is it not thy piety itself, which no longer letteth thee believe in a god? And thine overgreat honesty will yet lead thee even beyond good and evil. Behold, what hath been reserved for thee? Thou hast eyes and hands and mouth, which have been predestined for blessing from eternity. One doth not bless with the hand alone. Nigh unto thee, though thou professest to be the ungodliest one, I feel a hale and holy odor of long benedictions. I feel glad and grieved thereby. Let me be thy guest, O Zarathustra, for a single night. Nowhere on earth shall I now feel better than with thee. Amen, so shall it be, said Zarathustra with great astonishment. Up thither leadeth the way, there lieth the cave of Zarathustra. Gladly, forsooth, would I conduct thee thither myself, thou venerable one, for I love all pious men. But now a cry of distress calleth me hastily away from thee. In my domain shall no one come to grief. My cave is a good haven. And best of all, would I like to put every sorrowful one again on firm land and firm legs. Who, however, could take thy melancholy off thy shoulders? For that I am too weak. Long, verily, should we have to wait until some one reawoke thy God for thee. For that old God liveth no more. He is indeed dead. Thus spake Zarathustra. End chapter 66 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. The recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Frederick Nish Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 67 The Ugliest Man And again did Zarathustra's feet run through mountains and forests, and his eyes sought and sought, but nowhere was he to be seen whom they wanted to see, the solely distressed sufferer and crier. On the whole way, however, he rejoiced in his heart and was full of gratitude. What good things, said he, had this day given me, as amends for its bad beginning, what strange interlocutors have I found. At their words will I now chew a long while, as a good corn, small shall my teeth grind and crush them, until they flow like milk into my soul. When, however, the path again curved round a rock, all at once the landscape changed and Zarathustra entered into a realm of death. Here bristled aloft black and red cliffs, without any grass, tree, or bird's voice, for it was a valley which all animals avoided, even the beasts of prey, 
except that a species of ugly, thick, green serpent came here to die when they became old. Therefore, the shepherds called this valley Serpent Death. Zarathustra, however, became absorbed in dark recollections, for it seemed to him as if he had once before stood in this valley, and much heaviness settled on his mind, so that he walked slowly and always more slowly, and at last stood still. Then, however, when he opened his eyes, he saw something sitting by the wayside, shaped like a man, and hardly like a man, something nondescript. And all at once there came over Zathustra a great shame, because he had gazed on such a thing, blushing up to the very roots of his white hair. He turned aside his glance and raised his foot that he might leave this ill-starred place. Then, however, became the dead wilderness vocal, for from the ground a voice welled up, gurgling and rattling, as water gurgleth and rattleth at night, through stopped-up water pipes, and at last it turned into human voice and human speech. It sounded thus. Zarathustra, Zarathustra, read my riddle. Say, say, what is the revenge on the witness? I entice the black. Here is smooth eyes. See to it, see to it, that the pride do not hear break its legs. Thou thinkest thyself wise. Thou proud Zarathustra, read then the riddle, thou hard nutcracker, the riddle that I am. Say then, who am I? When, however, Zarathustra had heard these words, what think ye then took place in his soul? Pity overcame him, and he sank down all at once, like an oak that had long withstood many tree fellers, heavily, suddenly, to the terror of even those who meant to fell it. But suddenly he got up again from the ground, and his countenance began to stern. I know thee well, said he, with a brazen voice. Thou art the murderer of God. Let me go. Thou couldst not endure him who beheld thee, whoever beheld thee through and through. Thou ugliest man, thou tookest revenge on his witness. Thus spake Zarathustra, and was about to go, but the nondescript grasped at a corner of his garment, and began anew to gurgle and seek for words. Stay, said he at last, stay, do not pass by. I have divined what axe it was that struck thee to the ground. Hail to thee, O Zarathustra, that thou art again upon thy feet. Thou hast divined, I know it well, how the man feeleth who killed him, the murderer of God. Stay, sit down here beside me. It is not to no purpose. To whom would I go but unto thee? Stay. Sit down. Do not, however, look at me. Honor this, mine ugliness. They persecute me. Now art thou my last refugee. Not with their hatred, not with the beliefs. Oh, such persecution would I mock at, and be proud and cheerful. Had not all succeeded hitherto been with the well persecuted ones? And he who persecuteth well learneth readily to be obsequent. When once he is put behind, but it is their pity, their pity is it, from which I flee away and flee to thee. O Zarathustra, protect me, thou, my last refuge, thou sole one who divinedest me. Thou hast divined. How the man feeleth who killed him. Stay, and if thou wilt go, thou impatient one, go not the way that I came. That way is bad. 
Art thou angry with me because I have already racked language so long? Because I have already counseled thee? But know that it is I, the ugliest man, who have also the largest, heaviest feet. Where I have gone, the way is bad. I tread all paths to death and destruction. But that thou passest me by in silence, that thou blushedest, I saw it well thereby. Did I know thee as Zarathustra? Everyone else would have thrown to me his arms, his pity, in look and speech. But for that I am not beggar enough. That didst thou divine. For that I am too rich, rich in what is great, frightful, ugliest, most unutterable. Thy shame, O Zarathustra. Honored me. With difficulty did I get out of the crowd of the pitiful, that I might find the only one who at present teacheth that pity is obtrusive. Thyself, O Zarathustra, whether it be the pity of a god, or whether it be human pity, it is offensive to modesty. An unwillingness to help may be nobler than the virtue that rushes it to do so. That, however, namely pity, is called virtue itself at present by all petty people. They have no reverence for great misfortune, great ugliness, great failure. Beyond all these do I look, as a dog looketh. Over the backs of thronging flocks of sheep, they are petty, good-willed, good-willed, grey people. As the heron looketh contemptuously at shallow pools, with backward bent head, so do I look at the throng of grey little waves and wills and souls. Too long have we acknowledged them to be right, those petty people. So we have at last given them power as well, and now do they teach that God is only what petty people call good, and truth is at present what the preacher spake, who himself sprang from them, that singular saint and advocate of the petty people, who testified of himself, "I am the truth." That immodest one hath long made the petty people greatly puffed up. He who taught no small error, when he taught, "I am the truth," hath an immodest one ever been answered more courteously? Thou, however, O Zarathustra, passedest him, I, and saidest, "Nay, nay," three times, "Nay." Thou warnest. Against his error, thou warnest, thou first to do so, against pity. Not every one, not none, but thyself and thy type. Thou art ashamed of the shame of the great sufferer, and verily, when thou sayest, from pity there cometh a heavy cloud. Take heed, ye men. When thou teachest. All creators are hard. All great love is beyond their pity. O Zarathustra, how well versed dost thou seem to me in weather signs. Thou thyself, however, warn thyself also against that pity, for many are on their way to thee. Many suffering, doubting, despairing, drowning, freezing ones. I warn thee also against myself. Thou hast read my best, my worst riddle, myself, and what I have done. I know the axe that felled thee. But he had to die. He looked with eyes which beheld everything. He beheld men's steps and dregs, all his ignominy and ugliness. His pity knew no modesty. 
He crept into my dirtiest corners. This most prying, over-intrusive, over-pitiful one had to die. He ever beheld me. On such a witness I would have revenge, or not live myself. That God who beheld everything, and also man, that God had to die. Man cannot endure it, that such a witness should live. Thus spake the ugliest man. Zatustra, however, got up, and prepared to go on, for he felt frozen to the very bowels. Thou nondescript, said he, thou warnest me against thy path. As thanks for it, I praise mine to thee. Behold, up thither is the cave of Zatistra. My cave is large and deep, and hath many corners. There findeth he that is most hidden, his hiding place, and close beside it there are hundred lurking places and by places for creeping, fluttering, and hopping creatures. Thou outcast, who hast cast thyself out, thou wilt not live amongst men and men's pity. Well then, do like me, thus wilt thou learn also from me. Only the doer learneth, and talk first and foremost to mine animals, the proudest animal and the wisest animal. They might well be the right counsellors for us both. Thus spake Zarathustra and went his way, more thoughtfully and slowly even than before, for he asked himself many things and hardly knew what to answer. How poor indeed is man, thought he in his heart. How ugly, how wheezy, how full of hidden shame. They tell me that man loveth himself. Ah, how great must that self-love be! How much contempt is opposed to it! Even this man hath loved himself, as yet despised himself. A great lover methinketh he is, and a great despiser. No one have I yet found who more thoroughly despised himself even that is elevation. Alas, was this perhaps the higher man whose cry I heard? I love the great despisers. Man is something that had to be surpassed. End of chapter 67 Recorded by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Speaks Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 68 The Voluntary Beggar When Zarathustra had left the ugliest man, he was chilled and felt lonesome, for much coldness and lonesomeness came over his spirit, so that even his limbs became older thereby. When, however, he wandered on and on, up hill and down, at times past green meadows, though also sometimes over wild stony couches, where formerly perhaps an impatient brook had made its bed. Then he turned all at once warmer and heartier again. What hath happened unto me? He asked himself. Something warm and living quickeneth me. It must be in the neighborhood. Already am I less alone. Unconscious companions are in brethren drove around me. Their warm breath toucheth my soul. When, however, he spied about and sought for the comforters of his lonesomeness, behold, they were kind there standing together on an eminence whose proximity and smell had warmed his heart. 
The kind, however, seemed to listen eagerly to a speaker and took no heed of him who approached. When, however, Zarathustra was quite nigh unto them, then did he hear plainly that human voice spake in the midst of the kind, and apparently all of them had turned their heads towards the speaker. Then ran Zarathustra up speedily and drove the animals aside, for he feared that someone had here met with harm, which the pity of the kind would hardly be able to relieve. But in this he was deceived, for behold, there sat a man on the ground who seemed to be persuading the animals to have no fear of him. A peaceable man and preacher on the mount, out of whose eyes kindness itself preached. What dost thou seek here? asked Zarathustra in astonishment. What do I here seek? answered he. The same that thou seekest, thou mischief maker, that is to say, happiness upon earth. To that end, however, I would fain learn of this kind. For I tell thee that I have already talked half a morning unto them, and just now were they about to give me their answer. Why dost thou disturb them? Except we be converted and become as kind, we shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. For we ought to learn from them one thing, ruminating. And verily, although a man should gain the whole world, and yet not learn one thing, ruminating, what would it profit him? He would not be rid of his affliction, his great affliction, that, however, is at present called disgust. Who hath not at present his heart, his mouth, and his eyes full of disgust? Thou also, thou also, but behold this kind. Thus spake the preacher on the mount, and turned his own look towards Ratustra, for hitherto it had rested lovingly on the kind. Then, however, he put on a different expression. Who is this with whom I talk? He exclaimed frightened and sprang up from the ground. This is the man without disgust. This is Zarathustra himself, the surmounter of the great disgust. This is the eye. This is the mouth. This is the heart of Zarathustra himself. And whilst he thus spoke, he kissed with overflowing eyes the hands of him with whom he spoke, and behaved altogether like one to whom a precious gift and jewel had fallen unawares from heaven. The kind, however, gazed at it all and wondered. Speak not of me. Thou strange one, thou amiable one, said Zarathustra, and restrained his affection. Speak to me firstly of thyself. Art thou not the voluntary beggar who was cast away great riches, who was ashamed of his riches and of the rich, and fled to the poorest to bestow upon them his abundance and his heart? But they received him not. But they received me not, said the voluntary beggar. Thou knowest, forsooth. So I went at last to the animals and to those kind. Then learnedst thou, interrupted Zarathustra, how much harder is it to give properly than to take properly and that bestowing well is an art, 
the last subtlest master art of kindness. Especially nowadays, answered the voluntary beggar. At present, that is to say, when everything low had become rebellious and exclusive and haughty in its manner, in the manner of the populace. For the hour hath come, thou knowest it forsooth, for the great, evil, long, slow, mob and slave insurrection. It extendeth and extendeth. Now doth it provoke the lower classes, all benevolence and petty giving, and the over rich may be on their guard, whoever at present grip like bulgy bottles out of all too small necks of such bottles at present one willingly breaketh the necks wanton avidity bilious envy careworn revenge populous pride all this struck mine eye it is no longer true that the poor are blessed the kingdom of heaven however is with the kind and why is it not with the rich as Zarathustra temptingly while he kept back the kind which sniffed familiarly at the peaceful one why thou thou tempt me answered the other thou knowest it thyself better even than i what was it drove me to the poorest o Zarathustra? Was it not my disgust at the richest? At the culprits of riches, with cold eyes and rank thoughts, who pick up profit out of all kinds of rubbish, at this rabble that stinketh to heaven, at this gilded, falsified populace, whose fathers were pickpockets, O carrion crows, O rack pickers, with wise compliant, lewd, and forgetful, for they are all of them not far different from harlots. Populous above, populous below, what are poor and rich at present? That distinction did I learn, then did I flee away further and even further until I came to those kind. Thus spake the peaceful one, and puffed himself, and perspired with his words, so that the kind wondered anew. Zarathustra, however, kept looking into his face with a smile. All the time, the man talked so severely, and shook silently his head. Thou doest violence to thyself, thou preacher on the mount. And thou usest such severe words. For such severity, neither thy mouth nor thine eye have ever been given thee, nor me thinketh at thy stomach either, unto it all such rage and hatred and foaming over is repugnant. Thy stomach wanteth softer things. Thou art not a butcher, rather seemest thou to me a plant eater and a root man, perhaps the grandest corn. Certainly, however, thou art a worse to fleshly joys, and thou lovest honey. Thou hast divined me well, answered the voluntary beggar, with lightened heart, I love honey. I also grind corn, for I have sought out what tasteth sweetly and maketh pure breath. Also what requireth a long time, a day's work and a month's work for gentle idlers and sluggards. Furthest, to be sure, have those kind carried it. They have devised ruminating and lying in the sun. They also abstain from all heavy thoughts which inflate the heart. Well, says Zarathustra, 
thou shouldst also see mine animals, mine eagle, and my serpent. Their like do not at present exist on earth. Behold, thither leadeth the way to my cave. Be to night its guest, and talk to mine animals of the happiness of animals. Until I myself come home, for now a cry of distress calleth me hastily away from thee. Also, shouldest thou find new honey with me, ice cold, golden comb honey, eat it. Now, however, take leave at once of thy kind, thou strange one, thou amiable one, thought it be hard for thee. For they are thy warmest friends and perceptors. One accepted, whom I hold still dearer, answered the voluntary beggar. Thou thyself art good, O Zarathustra, and better even than a cow. Away, away with thee, thou evil flatterer, cried Zarathustra mischievously. Why dost thou spoil me with such praise and flattery, honey? Away, away from me, cried he once more, and heaved his stick at the fond beggar, who, however, ran nimbly away. End of chapter 68 Recorded by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Frederick Nisha Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 69 The Shadow Scarcely, however, was the voluntary beggar gone in haste, and Zarathustra again alone. When he heard behind him a new voice, which calleth out, Stay, Zarathustra, do wait, it is myself, forsooth, Zarathustra, myself, thy shadow. Zarathustra did not wait, for a sudden irritation came over him on account of the crowd and the crowding in his mountains. Whither hath my lonesomeness gone? spake he. It is verily becoming too much for me, these mountains form. My kingdom is no longer of this world. I require new mountains. My shadow calleth me. What matter about my shadow? Let it run after me. I run away from it. Thus pays her two strike to his heart and ran away. But the one behind followed after him, so that immediately there were three runners one after the other, namely, foremost the voluntary beggar, then Zarathustra, and thirdly and hindmost his shadow. But not long had they run thus, when Zarathustra became conscious of his folly, and shook off with one jerk all his irritation and detestation. What, said he, have not the most ludicrous things always happened to us old anchorites and saints? Verily, my folly hath grown big in the mountains. Now do I hear six old fools' legs rattling behind one another? But does Zarathustra need to be frightened by his shadow? Also, me think it that after all it hath longer legs than mine. Thus begs Zarathustra, and, laughing with eyes and entrails, he stood still and turned round quickly, and behold, he almost thereby threw his shadow and follower to the ground. So closely had the latter followed at his heels, and so weak was he, for when Zarathustra scrutinized him, with his glance he was frightened, as by a sudden apparition. So slender, swarthy, hollow, and worn out did his follower appear. 
who art thou? asked the twister vehemently. What doest thou here? And why callest thou thyself my shadow? Thou art not pleasing unto me. Forgive me, answered the shadow, that it is I, and if I please thee not, well, O Zatustra, therein do I admire thee, and thy good taste. A wanderer am I, who have walked long at thy heels, always on the way, but without a goal, also without a home so that verily I lack little of being the eternally wandering Jew, except that I am not eternal and not a Jew. What? Must I ever be on the way, willed by every wind, unsettled, driven about? O earth, thou hast become too round for me. On every surface have I already sat, like tired dust have I fall asleep on mirrors and window panes. Everything taketh from me, nothing giveth. I become thin, I am almost equal to a shadow. After thee, however, O Zatustra, did I fly and high longest. And though I hid myself from thee, I was nevertheless thy best shadow, wherever thou hast sat. There sat I also. With thee have I wandered about in the remotest, coldest worlds, like a phantom that voluntarily haunteth winter roofs and snows. With thee have I pushed into all the forbidden, all the worst and the furthest, and if there be anything of virtue in me, it is that I have had no fear of any prohibition. With thee have I broken up whatever my heart reward. All boundary stones and statues have I overthrown. The most dangerous wishes did I pursue. Verily, beyond every crime did I once go. With thee did I unlearn the belief in words and words in great names. When the devil casteth his skin, doth not his name also fall away? It is also skin. The devil himself is perhaps skin. Nothing is true. All is permitted. So said I to myself. Into the coldest water did I plunge with head and heart. Ah, how oft did I stand there, naked on that account, like a red crab. Ah, where have gone all my goodness, and all my shame, and all my belief in the good. Ah, where is the lying innocence which I once possessed, the innocence of the good and of their noble lies? Too oft, verily, did I follow close to the heels of truth. Then did it kick me on the face. Sometimes I meant to lie, and behold, then only did I hit the truth. Too much had become clear unto me. Now it doth not concern me any more. Nothing liveth any longer that I love. How should I still love myself? To live as I incline, or not to live at all, so do I wish. So wish it also the holiest. But alas, how have I still inclination? Have I still a goal, a heaven towards which my sail is set? A good wind, ah, he only who knoweth whither he saileth, knoweth what wind is good, and a fair wind for him. What still remaineth to me, a heart weary and flippant, an unstable will, fluttering wings, a broken backbone. This seeking for my home, O Zatustra, dost thou know? that this seeking hath been my home, sickening, it eateth me up. Where is my home? For it too I ask and seek, and have sought, but have not found it. O Eternal everywhere, O Eternal nowhere, O Eternal in vain. Thus spake the shadow, and the Tustra's countenance lendered at his words. Thou art my shadow, 
said he at last sadly. Thy danger is but small, thou free spirit and wanderer. Thou hast had a bad day. See that a still worse evening doth not overtake thee. To such unsettled ones as thou, seemeth at last even a prisoner blessed. Didst thou ever see how captured criminals sleep? They sleep quietly, they enjoy their new security. Beware lest, in the end, a narrow faith capture thee, a hard, rigorous delusion. For now everything that is narrow and fixed seduceth and tempteth thee. Thou hast lost thy goal, alas, how wilt thou forgo and forget that loss? Thereby hast thou also lost thy way, thou poor rover and rambler. Thou tired butterfly, wilt thou have a rest and a home this evening? Then go up to my cave. Thither leadeth the way to my cave, and now will I run quickly away from thee again. Already lieth as it were a shadow upon me. I will run alone, so that it may again become bright around me. Therefore must I still be a long time merrily upon my legs. In the evening, however, they will be dancing with me. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of chapter 69 Recorded by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 70 Noontide And Zarathustra ran and ran, but he found no one else, and was alone and ever found himself again. He enjoyed and quaffed his solitude, and thought of good things for hours. About the hour of noontide, however, when the sun stood exactly over Zatustra's head, he passed an old, bent, and gnarled tree, which was encircled round by ardent love of a vine, and hidden from itself. From this there hung yellow grapes in abundance, confronting the wanderer. Then he felt inclined to quench a little thirst and to bake off for himself a cluster of grapes. When, however, he had already his arm outstretched for that purpose, he felt still more inclined for something else, namely, to lie down beside the tree at the hour of perfect noontide and sleep. This Zaratustra did, and no sooner had he laid himself on the ground in the stillness and secrecy of the variegated grass, then he had forgotten his little thirst and fell asleep. For as the proverb of Zarathustra said, one thing is more necessary than the other, only that his eyes remained open, for they never grew weary of viewing and admiring the tree and the love of the vine. In falling asleep, however, Zarathustra spake thus to his heart, Hush, hush, hath not the world now become perfect? What hath happened unto me? As a delicate wing danceth invisibly upon packeted seas, light, feather, light, so danceth sleep upon me. No I doth it close to me, it leaveth my soul awake, Light is it, verily, feather light. It persuadeth me, I know not how. It toucheth me inwardly with a caressing hand. It constraineth me, yeah, it constraineth me, so that my soul stretcheth itself out. How long and weary it becometh, my strange soul hath a seventh day evening come to it precisely at noontide, hath it already wandered too long, blissfully, among good and ripe things. 
it stretched itself out long longer it lies still my strange soul too many good things hath it already tasted this golden sadness oppresses it it distorteth its mouth as a ship that putteth into the calmest cove it now draweth up to the land weary of long voyages and uncertain seas is not the land more faithful as such a ship hugeth the shore tugeth the shore then it sufficeth for a spider to spin its thread from the ship to the land no stronger ropes are required there as such a weary ship in the calmest cove so do i also now repose nigh to the earth faithful trusting waiting bound to it with the lightest threads o happiness o happiness wilt thou perhaps sing o my soul thou liest in the grass which is the secret solemn hour when no shepherd playeth his pipe take care hot noon tide sleepeth on the fields do not sing hush the world is perfect do not sing the prairie bird my soul do not even whisper lo hush the old noon tide sleepeth it moveth its mouth doth it not just now drink a drop of happiness an old brown drop of golden happiness golden wine something whisket over it its happiness laugheth thus laugheth a god hush for happiness how little sufficeth for happiness thus spake i once and thought myself wise but it was blasphemy that have i not learned wise fools speak better the least thing precisely the gentlest thing the lightest thing a lizard's rustling a breath a whisk an eye glance little make it up the best happiness hush what hath befallen me hark hath time flown away do i not fall have i not fallen hark into the well of eternity what happeneth to me hush it stingeth me alas to the heart to the heart oh break up break up my heart after such happiness after such a sting what hath not the world just now become perfect round and ripe oh for the golden round ring whither does it fly let me run after it quick hush and there the tushra stretched himself and felt that he was asleep up said he to himself thou sleeper thou noon tight sleeper well then up ye old legs it is time and more than time many a good stretch of road is still awaiting you now have ye slept your fill for how long a time a half eternity well then up now mine old heart for how long after such a sleep mayest thou remain awake but then he fell asleep anew and his soul spake against him and defended itself and lay down again leave me alone hush hath not the world just now become perfect oh for the golden round ball get up said zarathustra thou little thief thou sluggard what still stretching thyself yawning sighing failing into deep wells who art thou then o my soul and here he became frightened for a sunbeam shot down from heaven upon his face o heaven above me said he sighing and sat upright thou gazest at me thou hearkenest unto my strange soul when wilt thou drink this drop of dew that fell down upon all earthly things 
when wilt thou drink this strange soul? When thou, well of eternity, thou joyous, awful, noontide abyss, when wilt thou drink my soul back into thee? Thus spake Zarathustra, and rose from his couch beside the tree, as awakening from a strange drunkenness, and behold, there stood the sun still exactly above his head. One might, however, rightly infer therefrom that Zarathustra had not then slept long. End of chapter 70 Recorded by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. This recording is in the public domain. The Space Zatustra by Fetrik Nisha Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 71 The Creating It was late in the afternoon, only when Zatustra after long useless searching and strolling about, again came home to his cave. When, however, he stood over against it, not more than twenty paces therefrom, the thing happened which he now least of all expected. He heard anew the great cry of distress, an extraordinary. This time the cry came out of his own cave. It was a long, manifold, peculiar cry, and Zarathustra plainly distinguished that it was composed of many voices. Although heard at a distance, it might sound like the cry out of a single mouth. Thereupon Zarathustra rushed forward to his cave, and behold, what a spectacle awaited him after that concert, for there did they all sit together, whom he had passed during the day, the king on the right and the king on the left, the old magician, the pope, the voluntary beggar, the shadow, the intellectually conscientious one, the sorrowful soothsayer, and the ass. The ugliest man, however, had set a crown on his head and had put round him two purple girdles, for a light, like all ugly ones, disguised himself and lay the handsome person. In the midst, however, of this sorrowful company stood Zratustra's eagle, ruffled and disquieted, for it had been called upon to answer too much for its pride had not any answer. The wise serpent, however, hung round its neck. All this did Zarathustra behold with great astonishment. Then, however, he scrutinized each individual quest with courteous curiosity, read their souls, and wondered anew. In the meantime, the assembled ones had risen from the seats and waited with reverence for Zarathustra to speak. Zarathustra, however, spake thus, Ye despairing ones, ye strange one, so it was your cry of distress that I heard, and now do I know, also, where he is to be sought, whom I have sought for in vain today, the higher man. In mine own cave sitteth he, the higher man, but why do, I wonder, have not I myself allured him to me by honey offerings and artful your calls of my happiness? But it seemeth to me that ye are badly adapted for company. Ye make one another's hearts fretful. Ye that cry for help when ye sit here together. There is one that must first come, one who will make you laugh even more. A good jovial buffoon, a dancer, a wind, a wild romp, some old fool. What think ye? Forgive me, however, ye despairing ones, for speaking such trivial words before you, unworthy, verily, of such guests. 
but ye do not have divine what maketh my heart wanton. Ye yourselves do it, and your aspect forgive it me. For every one becometh courageous who beholdeth a despairing one. To encourage a despairing one, every one thinketh himself strong enough to do so. To myself have ye given this power, a good gift, mine honourable guest, an excellent guest present. Well, do not then upbraid when I also offer you something of mine. This is mine empire and my dominion. That which is mine, however, shall this evening and tonight be yours. Mine animals shall serve you. Let my cave be your resting place. At house and home with me shall no one despair. In my pearliest do I protect everyone from his wild beasts. And that is the first thing which I offer you, security. The second thing, however, is my little finger. And when ye have that, then take whole hand also. Yeah, and the heart with it. Welcome here. Welcome to you, my guest. Thus spake Zaratustra, and laughed with love and mischief. After this greeting, his guests bowed once more, and were reverentially silent. The king on the right, however, answered him in the name. O Zaratustra, by the way, in which thou hast given us thy hand and thy greeting, we recognize thee as Zaratustra. Thou hast humbled thyself before us, almost hast thou hurt our reverence. Who, however, could have humbled himself as thou hast done, with such pride? That uplifted us ourselves, a refreshment is it, to our eyes and hearts. To behold this, merely, gladly would we ascend higher mountains than this, for as eager beholders have we become. We wanted to see what brighteneth dim eyes. And lo, now is it all over with our cries of distress. Now are our minds and hearts open and enraptured. Little is lacking for our spirits to become wanton. There is nothing, O Zarathustra, that groweth more pleasingly on earth than a lofty, strong will. It is the finest growth. An entire landscape refreshes itself at one such tree. To the pine do I compare him, O Zarathustra, which groweth up like thee, tall, silent, hardy, solitary, of the best, supplest wood, stately. In the end, however, grasping out for its dominion with strong, green branches, asking weighty questions of the wind, the storm, and whatever is at home on high places, answering more vaguely, a commander, a victor, oh, who should not ascend high mountains to behold such growths? At thy tree, O Zatustra, the gloomy and ill-constituted also refresh themselves. At thy look, even the wavering becomes steady and heal their hearts. And verily towards thy mountain and thy tree do many eyes turn today. A great longing hath arisen, and many have learned to ask, Who is Zarathustra? And those into whose ears thou hast at any time dipped thy song and thy honey, all the hidden ones, the lone dwellers and the twain dwellers, have simultaneously said to their hearts, Doth Zarathustra still alive? Is it no longer worthwhile to live? Everything is indifferent, everything is useless, or else we must live with Zarathustra. Why doth he not come who hath so long announced himself? Thus do many people ask, hath solitude swallowed him up? Or should we perhaps go up to him? Now doth it come to pass that solitude itself becometh fragile and breaketh open? 
like a grave that breaketh open and can no longer hold its dead. Everywhere one seeth resurrected ones. Now do the waves rise and rise around the mountain, O Zarathustra. And however high be thy height, many of them must rise up to thee. Thy boat shall not rest much longer on dry ground. And that we despairing ones have now come into thy cave, and already no longer despair. It is but a prognostic and a presage that better ones are on the way to thee. For they themselves are on the way to thee, the last remnant of God among men, that is to say, all the men of great longing, of great loathing, of great satiety, all who do not want to live unless they learn again to hope, unless they learn from thee, O Zathustra, the great hope. Thus spake the king on the right, and seized the hand of Zathustra in order to kiss it. But Zathustra checked his veneration, and stood back frightened, fleeing as it were, silently and suddenly into the far distance. After a little while, however, he was again at home with his guests, looked at them with clear scrutinizing eyes, and said, my guests, ye higher men, I will speak plain language and plainly with you. It is not for you that I have waited here in these mountains. Plain language and plainly? Good God, said here the king on the left to himself. One seeth he doth not know the good occidentals this sage out of the Orient. But he meaneth blunt language and bluntly. Well, that is not the worst taste in these days. Ye may verily all of you be higher men, continued Zatustra. But for me ye are neither high enough nor strong enough. For me, that is to say, for the inexorable which is now silent in me, but will not always be silent. And if ye appertain to me, it is not as my right arm. For he who himself standeth like you, on sticky and tender legs, wisheth above all to be treated indulgently, whether he be conscious of it or hide it from himself. My arms and my legs, however, I do not treat indulgently. I do not treat my warriors indulgently. How then could ye be fit for my warfare? With you I should spoil all my victories, and many of you would tumble over if ye but heard the loud beating of my drums. Moreover, ye are not sufficiently beautiful and well born for me. I require pure, smooth mirrors for my doctrine. On your surface, even mine own likeness is distorted. On your shoulders presseth many a burden, many a recollection, many a mischievous dwarf squatteth in your corners. There is concealed populace also in you. And though ye be high and of a higher type, much in you is crooked and mishappen. There is no smith in the world that could hammer you right and straight for me. Ye are only bridges. May high words pass over upon you, ye signify steps, so do not upbraid him who ascendeth beyond you into his height. Out of your seat there may one day arise for me a genuine son and perfect hair, but that time is distant, ye yourselves are not those unto whom my heritage and name belong. Not for you do I wait here in these mountains. Not with you may I descend for the last time. You have come unto me only as a presage that high ones are on the way to me. Not the men of great longing, of great loathing, of great satiety, and that which ye call the remnant of God. Nay, nay, three times nay, for others do, 
I wait here in these mountains, and will not lift my foot from thence without them. For higher ones, stronger ones, triumphant ones, merrier ones, for such as are built squarely in body and soul, laughing lions must come. O oh, my guests, ye strange ones, have ye heard nothing of my children, and that they are on the way to me? Do speak unto me of my gardens, of my happy isles, of my new beautiful race. Why do ye not speak unto me thereof? This guest present do I solicit of your love, that ye speak unto me of my children. For them am I rich, for them I became poor. What have I not surrendered? What would I not surrender that I might have one thing? These children, this living plantation, these life trees of my will and my highest hope. Thus spake Zarathustra, and stopped suddenly in his doctrine, for his longing came over him, and he closed his eyes and his mouth, because of the agitation of his heart. And all his guests were also silent, and stood there and confounded, except only that the old soothsayer made signs with his hands and his gestures. End of chapter 71 Recorded by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Jain. This recording is in the public domain. Thus spake Zathustra by Vedic Nishe Translated by Thomas Common Part 4 Chapter 72 the supper. For at this point, the soothsayer interrupted the greeting of Zarathustra and his guests. He pressed forward as one who had no time to lose, seized Zarathustra's hand, and exclaimed, But Zarathustra, one thing is more necessary than the other, so you sayest thou thyself, Well, one thing is now more necessary unto me than all others. A word at the right time, didst thou not invite me to table? And here are many who have made long journeys. Thou dost not mean to feed us merely with discourses. Besides, all of you have thought too much about freezing, drowning, suffocating, and other bodily dangers. None of you, however, have thought of my danger namely, perishing of hunger. Thus spake the soothsayer. When the Tushtra's animals, however, heard these words, they ran away in terror, for they saw that all they had brought home during the day would not be enough to fill the one soothsayer. Likewise, perishing of thirst, continued the soothsayer, and although I hear water splashing here like words of wisdom, that is to say, plenteously and unweariedly, I want wine. Not everyone is a born water drinker like Zarathustra, neither did water suit weary and withered ones. We deserve wine. It alone giveth immediate vigor and improvised health. On this occasion, when the soothsayer was longing for wine, it happened that a king on the left, the silent one, also found expression for once. We took care, said he, about wine. I, along with my brother, the king on the right, we have enough of wine, a whole ass load of it, so there is nothing lacked but bread. Bread, replied Zarathustra, laughing when he spake. It is precisely bread that anchorites have not, but man doth not live by bread alone, but also by the flesh of good lambs, of which I have two. 
These shall be slaughtered quickly and quick spicily with sage. It is so that I like them, and there is also no lack of roots and fruits, good enough even for the fastidious and dainty, nor the nuts and other riddles for cracking. Thus will we have a good repast in a little while, but whoever wish to eat with us must also give a hand to the work, even the kings. For with Zarathustra, even a king may be a cook. This proposal appeared to the hearts of all of them, save that the voluntary beggar objected to the flesh and wine and spices. Just hear this glutton Zarathustra, said he jokingly. Doth one go into caves and high mountains to make such repasts? Now indeed do I understand what he once taught us, blessed be moderate poverty, and why he wished to do away with beggars. Be good of cheer, replied Zarathustra, as I am. Abide by the customs, thou excellent one, grind thy corn, drink thy water, praise thy cooking, if only it make thee glad. I am a law only for my own, I am not a law for all. He, however, who belongeth unto me, must be strong of bone and light of food, joyous in fight and feast, no sulker, no john or dreams, ready for the hardest task as for the feast, healthy and hale. The best belongeth unto mine and me. And if it be not given us, then do we take it the best food, the purest sky, the strongest thoughts, the fairest woman. Thus spake Zarathustra. The king on the right, however, answered and said, Strange, did one ever hear such sensible things out of the mouth of a wise man? And verily, it is the strangest thing in a wise man, if over and above he be still sensible and not an ass. Thus spake the king on the right and wondered. The ass, however, with ill will, said, he yeah, to his remark. This, however, was the beginning of that long repast which is called the supper in the history books, and this there was nothing else spoken of but the higher man. End of chapter 72 Recorded by Ashwin Chen This is a LibriVox.org recording by Ashwin Chen. This recording is in the public domain. Thus spake Zarathustra by Frederick Nisha, translated by Thomas Common, Part 4, Chapter 73 The Higher Man 1. When I came unto men for the first time, then did I commit the anchorite folly, the great folly. I appeared on the marketplace, and when I spake unto all, I spake unto none. In the evening, however, Rope dancers were my companions, and corpses, and myself almost a corpse. With the new morning, however, they came unto me a new truth. Then did I learn to say, Of what account to me a marketplace, and populous, and populous noise, and long populous years? Ye higher men, learn this from me. On the marketplace no one believeth in higher men, but if ye will speak there, very well, the populace, however, blinketh, we are all equal. Ye higher men, so blinketh the populace, there are no higher men, we are all equal, man is man, before God, we are all equal. 
before God now. However, this God had died. Before the populace, however, we will not be equal. We hire men away from the marketplace. Section 2 Before God, now however, this God had died. Ye hire men, this God was your greatest danger. Only since he lay in the grave have ye again arisen. Now only cometh the great moon tide, now only doth the hire man become master. Have ye understood this word, O my brethren? Ye are frightened. Do your hearts turn giddy? Doth the abyss here yawn for you? Doth the hell hound here help at you? Well, take heart, ye higher men. Now only traveleth the mountain of the human future. God had died. Now do we desire the superman to live. 3. The most careful ask today, How is man to be maintained? Zatustra, however, asketh, as the first and only one, how is man to be surpassed? The superman I have at heart, that is the first and the only thing to me, and not man, not the neighbor, not the poorest, not the sorriest, not the best. O oh, my brethren, what can I love in man is that he is an overgoing and downgoing. And also in you there is much that maketh me love and hope. In that ye have despised ye higher men, that maketh me hope, for the great despisers are the great reverers. In that ye have despaired, there is much to honor, for ye have not learned to submit yourselves, ye have not learned pretty policy. For today have petty people become master. They all preach submission and humility and policy and diligence and consideration and the long etc. of petty virtues. Whatever is the effeminate type, whatever originated from the servile type and especially in the populist mismatch, that wishes now to be master of all human destiny. Or disgust, disgust, disgust. That asketh and asketh and never tireth. How is man to maintain himself best, longest, most pleasantly? Thereby, are they the masters of today? These masters of today surpass them. O oh my brethren, these petty people, they are Superman's greatest danger. Surpass, a higher man, the petty virtues, the petty policy. The sanguine considerateness, the anthill trumpery, the pitiable comfortableness, the happiness of the greatest number. And rather despair than submit yourselves. And verily, I love you, because ye know not today how to live, ye higher men, for thus do ye live best. 4. Have ye courage, O my brethren? Are ye stout-hearted, not the courage before the witness, but anchorite and eagle courage, which not even a god any longer beholdeth? Cold souls, mules, the blind and the drunken, I do not call stout-hearted. He had a heart who knoweth fear, but vanquisheth it, who seeth the abyss, but with pride. He who seeth the abyss, but with eagle's eyes, he who with eagle's talons graspeth the abyss, he hath courage. 5. Man is evil, so said to me for consolation, all the wisest ones. Ah, if only it be still true today, for the evil is man's best foes. Man must become better and eviler, so do I teach. The evilest is necessary for the superman's best. It may have been well for the preacher of the petty people to suffer and be burdened by men's sin. I, however, rejoice in great sin as my consolation. Such things, however, 
and not said for long years. Every word, also, is not suited for every mouth. These are fine far away things, at them sheep's claws shall not grasp. 6. Ye hire men, think ye that you sufferers, or show you restless, miswandering, misclimbing ones, new and easier footpaths? Nay, nay, three times nay, always more, always better ones of your type shall succumb. For ye shall always have it worse and harder. Thus only, thus only groweth man aloft to the height where the lightning striketh and shattereth him high enough for the lightning. Towards the few, the long, the remote go forth my soul and my seeking of what account to me are your many little short miseries. Ye do not yet suffer enough for me, for ye suffer from yourselves. Ye have not yet suffered from man. Ye would lie if ye spake otherwise. None of you suffereth from what I have suffered. 7. It is not enough for me that the lightning no longer doeth harm. I do not wish to conduct it away. It shall learn to work for me. My wisdom had accumulated long like a cloud. It becometh stiller and darker, so doeth all wisdom, we shall one day bear lightnings. And to these men of today will I not be light, nor be called light, them will I blind, lightning of my wisdom, put out their eyes. 8. Do not will anything beyond your power. There is a bad falseness in those who will beyond their power, especially when they will great things. For they awake and distrust in great things, these subtle false coiners and stage players, until at last they are false towards themselves, squint-eyed, whited cankers, glossed over with strong words, parade virtues and brilliant false deeds. Take good care there, ye higher men, for nothing is more precious to me and rarer than honesty. Is this today not that of the populace? The populace, however, knoweth not what is great and what is small, what is straight and what is honest. It is innocently crooked, it ever lieth. 9. Have a good distress today, ye higher men, ye enheartened ones, ye open-hearted ones, and keep your reason secret, for this today is that of the populace. What the populace once learned to believe without reasons, who could refute it to them by means of reasons? And on the marketplace, one convinces it with gestures. But reasons make the populace distrustful, and when truth hath once triumphed there, then ask yourselves with good distrust, what strong error hath fought for it? Be on your guard also against the learned. They hate you, because they are unproductive. They have cold, withered eyes, before which the every bird is unplumed. Such persons want about not lying, but inability to lie is still far from being loved to truth. Be on your guard. Freedom from fever is still far from being knowledge. Refrigerated spirits I do not believe in. He who cannot lie doth know what truth is. 10. If ye would go up high, then use your own legs. Do not get yourselves carried aloft. Do not seat yourselves on other people's backs and heads. Thou hast mounted, however, on house back. Thou now risest briskly up to thy goal. Well, my friend, 
but thy lame foot is also with thee horseback. When thou reachest thy goal, when thou alightest from the horse, precisely on thy height, thou higher man, then wilt thou stumble. 11. Ye creating ones, ye higher men, one is only pregnant with one's own child. Do not let yourselves be imposed upon or put upon. Who then is your neighbor? Even if ye act for your neighbor, ye still do not create for him. Unlearn, I pray you, this for ye creating ones, your very virtue wisheth you to have not to do with for and on account of and because. Against these false little words shall ye stop your ears. For one's neighbor is the virtue only of the petty people. There it is said, like and like, and hand washeth hand. They have neither the right nor the power for your self-seeking. In your self-seeking, ye creating ones, there is the foresight and foreseeing of the pregnant. What no one's eye hath yet seen, namely, the fruit, this sheltereth and saveth and nourisheth your entire love. Where your entire love is, namely, with your child, there is also your entire virtue. Your work, your will is your neighbor. Let no false values impose upon you. 12. Ye creating ones, ye higher men, whoever had to give birth is sick, whoever had given birth, however, is unclean. Ask women, one given birth, not because it giveth pleasure, the pain maketh hands and poets cackle. Ye creating ones, in you there is much uncleanliness. That is because ye have had to be mothers. A new child, oh, uh, how much new filth hath also come into the world. Go apart, he who hath given birth shall wash his soul. 13. Be not virtuous beyond your powers, and seek nothing from yourselves opposed to probability. Walk in the footsteps in which your father's virtue hath already walked. How would ye rise high, if your father's will should not rise with you? He, however, who would be a firstling, let him take care lest he also become a lastling. And where the vices of your fathers are, they should ye not set up as saints. He whose fathers were inclined for women, and for strong wine and flesh of wild boar swine, what would it be if he demanded chastity of himself? A folly would it be, much verily, doth it seem to me for such a one, if he should be the husband of one or two or of three women. And if he found in monasteries and inscribed over their portals the way to holiness, I should still say, what good is it? It is a new folly. He has founded for himself a penance, house and refuge, house much good may it do, but I do not believe in it. In solitude there groweth what any one bringeth into it, also the brute in one's nature. Thus is solitude inadvisable unto many. Had there ever been anything filthier on earth than the saints of the wilderness, around them was not only the devil loose, but also the swine. 14. Shy, ashamed, awkward, like the tiger whose spring hath failed. Thus, ye higher men, have I often seen you 
fling aside a caste which a maid had failed. But what doth it matter? He dies plays. He had not learned to play and mock, as one must play and mock. Do we not ever sit at a great table of mocking and playing? And if great things have been a failure with you, have you yourselves therefore been a failure? And if ye yourselves have been a failure, hath man therefore been a failure? If man, however, hath been a failure, well then, never mind. 15. They hire its type, always the seldomer thought a thing succeed. Ye hire men here, have ye not all been failures? Be of good cheer, what doth it matter? How much is still possible? Learn to laugh at yourselves, as ye ought to laugh. What wonder, even that ye have failed, and only half succeeded, ye half shattered ones? Doth not man's future strive and struggle in you? Man's furthest, profoundest, star highest issues, his prodigious powers, do not all those foam through one another in your vessel? What wonder that many a vessel shattered? Learn to laugh at yourselves, as you ought to laugh, ye higher men. Oh, how much is still possible? And verily, how much hath already succeeded? How rich in this earth is small, good, perfect things, in well-constituted things. Set around you small, good, perfect things, ye higher men. Their golden maturity healeth the heart, the perfect teacheth one to hope. 16. What hath hitherto been the greatest sin here on earth? Was it not the word of him who said, Woe unto them that laugh now? Did he himself find no cause for laughter on the earth? Then he saw it badly. A child even findeth cause for it. He did not love sufficiently, otherwise would he also have loved us, the laughing ones. But he hated and hooted us, wailing and teeth gnashing, he promises. Must one then curse immediately, when one doth not love? That seemed to me bad taste. Thus did he. However, this absolute one, he sprang from the populace, and he himself just did not love sufficiently, otherwise would he have raged less, because people did not love him. All great love doth not seek love, it seeketh more. Go out of the way of all such absolute ones, they are a poor sickly type a populist type. They look at this life with ill will. They have an evil life for this earth. Go out of the way of all such absolute ones. They have heavy feet and sultry hearts. They do not know how to dance. How could the earth be light to such ones? 17. Tortuously do all good things come nigh to the goal. Like cats they curve their backs, they pull inwardly with their approaching happiness, all good things laugh. His step betrayeth whether a person already walketh on his own path. Just see me walk, he, however, who cometh nigh to his goal, danceth. And verily, a statue have I not become, not yet do I stand there stiff, stupid, and sturdy, like a pillar, I love fast racing. And though there be on earth fens and dense afflictions, he who hath light feet runneth even across the mud, and danceth as upon well swept eyes. Lift up your hearts, my brethren, high, higher, and do not forget your legs. Lift up also your legs. Ye good dancers, 
and better still if you stand upon your heads. 18. This crown of the laughter, this rose garland crown, I myself has put on this crown, I myself have consecrated my laughter. No one else have I found today put enough for this. Zaratustra the dancer, Zaratustra the light one, who beckoneth with his pinions, one ready for flight, beckoning unto all birds, ready and prepared, a blissfully light spirited one. Zaratustra the sooth laugher, no impatient one, no absolute one, one who loveth leaves and side leaves, I myself have put on this crown. 19. Lift up your hearts, my brethren, high, higher, and do not forget your legs. Lift up your legs, ye good dancers, and better still if you stand upon your heads. There are also heavy animals in a state of happiness. There are club footed ones from the beginning. Curiously, do they exhaust themselves? like an elephant which endeavoureth to stand upon its head. Better, however, to be foolish with happiness than foolish with misfortune. Better to dance awkwardly than walk lamely. So learn, I pray you, my wisdom, ye higher men, even the worst thing had two good reverse sides. Even the worst thing hath good dancing legs, so learn, I pray you, ye higher men, to put yourselves on your proper legs. So unlearn, I pray you, the sorrow sighting, and all the populous sadness. Oh, how sad the buffoons of the populace seem to me today. This today, however, is that of the populace. 20. Do like unto the wind when it rusheth forth from the, its mountain caves, unto its own piping will it dance. The seas tremble and leap under its steps. That which giveth wings to asses, that which milketh the lanus, praised be that good and ruly spirit which cometh like a hurricane unto all the present and unto all the populace, which is hostile to thistle heads and puzzle heads, and to all withered leaves and weeds, praised be this wild, good, free spirit of the storm, which danceth upon fens and afflictions as upon meadows, which hateth the consumptive populace dogs and all the ill-constituted sullen brood, praised be the spirit of all free spirits, the laughing storm, which bloweth dust into the eyes of all the melanopic and melancholic. Ye higher men, the worst thing in you is that ye have none of you learned to dance as ye ought to dance, to dance beyond yourselves. What doth it matter that ye have failed? How many things are still possible, so learn to laugh beyond yourselves. Lift up your hearts, ye good dancers, high, higher, and do not forget the good laughter. This crown of the laughter, this rose garland crown, to you, my brethren, do I cast this crown. Laughing have I consecrated. Ye higher men, learn, I pray you to laugh. End of chapter 73 Recording by Ashwin Jain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4, Chapter 74 The Song of Melancholy 1. When Zarathustra spake these sayings, he stood nigh to the entrance of his cave. With the last words, however, he slipped away from his guests, and fled for a little while into the open air. O oh, pure odors around me, cried he, O oh, blessed stillness around me! But where are mine animals? Hither, hither, mine eagle and my serpent! Tell me, mine animals, these higher men, all of them, do they perhaps not smell well? O oh, pure odors around me! Now only do I know and feel how I love you, mine animals. And Zarathustra said once more, I love you, mine animals. The eagle, however, and the serpent pressed close to him when he spake these words, and looked up to him. In this attitude were they all three silent together, and sniffed and sipped the good air with one another. For the air here outside was better than with the higher men. 2. Hardly, however, had Zarathustra left the cave, when the old magician got up, looked cunningly about him, and said, He is gone. And already, ye higher men, let me tickle you with this complimentary and flattering name, as he himself doeth. Already doth mine evil spirit of deceit and magic attack me, my melancholy devil, which is an adversary to this Zarathustra from the very heart. Forgive it for this. Now doth it wish to conjure before you. It hath just its hour. In vain do I struggle with this evil spirit. Unto all of you, whatever honors ye like to assume in your names, whether you call yourselves the free spirits, or the conscientious, or the penitents of the spirit, or the unfettered, or the great longers, unto all of you, who, like me, suffer from the great loathing to whom the old god hath died, and as yet no new god lieth in cradles and swaddling clothes, unto all of you is mine evil spirit and magic, devil favorable. I know you, ye higher men, I know him. I know also this fiend whom I love in spite of me, this Zarathustra. He himself often seemeth to me like the beautiful mask of a saint, like a new strange mummery, in which mine evil spirit, the melancholy devil, delighteth. I love Zarathustra, so doth it often seem to me, for the sake of mine evil spirit. But already doth it attack me, and constrain me, this spirit of melancholy, this evening twilight devil, and verily, ye higher men, it hath a longing. Open your eyes, it hath a longing to come naked, whether male or female I do not yet know. But it cometh, it constraineth me. Alas, open your wits. The day dieth out, unto all things cometh now the evening, also unto the best things. Hear now and see, ye higher men, what devil, man or woman, this spirit of evening melancholy is. Thus spake the old magician, looked cunningly about him, and then seized his harp. 3. In evening's limpid air, what time the dew soothing, unto the earth down pour, invisibly and unheard, for tender shoe-gear wear the soothing dews, like all that's kind gentle. Bethinkest thou then, bethinkest thou, burning heart, how once thou thirstedest for heaven's kindly tear-drops and dew's down droppings all singed and weary thirstedest what time on yellow grass pathways wicked occidental sunny glances through sombre trees about thee sported blindingly sunny glow glances gladly hurting of truth the wooer thou so taunted they nay merely poet, a brute insidious, plundering, groveling, that I must lie, that wittingly, willfully, I must lie, for booty lusting, 
motley masked, self-hidden, shrouded, himself his booty, he, of truth the wooer, nay, mere fool, mere poet, just motley speaking, from mask of fool, confusedly shouting, circumambling on fabricated word bridges, on motley rainbow arches, twixt the spurious heavenly and spurious earthly, round us roving, round us soaring, mere fool, mere poet. He, of truth the wooer, not still, stiff, smooth, and cold, become an image, a godlike statue, set up in front of temples, as a god's own door-guard. Nay, hostile to all such truthfulness statues, in every desert homelier than at temples, with caddish wantonness, through every window leaping quickly into chances, every wild forest a-sniffing, greedily longing, sniffing, that thou, in wild forests, mong the motley speckled fierce creatures, shouldest rove, sinful sound and fine-colored, with longing lips smacking, blessedly mocking, blessedly hellish, blessedly bloodthirsty, robbing, skulking, lying roving, or unto eagles, like which fixedly, long adown the precipice look, adown their precipice. Oh, how they whirl down now, thereunder, therein, to ever deeper profoundness whirling, then sudden, with aim aright, with quivering flight, on lambkins pouncing, headlong down, sore hungry, for lambkins longing, fierce against all the lamb spirits, furious fierce, all that look sheep-like, or lamb-eyed, or crisp woolly, gray with lamb-sheep kindliness. Even thus, eagle-like, panther-like, are the poet's desires, are thine own desires, neath a thousand guises. Thou fool, thou poet, thou who all mankind viewest, so God as sheep, the God to rend within mankind, as the sheep in mankind, and in rending, laughing. That, that is thine own blessedness, of a panther, an eagle blessedness, of a poet and fool, the blessedness. In evening's limpid air, what time the moon's sickle, green, twixt the purple glowings, and jealous, stealeth forth. Of day the foe, with every step in secret, the rosy garland hammocks, down sickling, till they've sunken down nightwards, faded, down sunken. Thus had I sunken one day, from mine own truth and sanity, from mine own fervid day longing, of day a-weary, sick of sunshine, sunk downwards, evenwards, shadowwards, by one sole trueness, all scorched and thirsty. Bethinkest thou still, bethinkest thou, burning heart, how then thou thirstedest, that I should band be from all the trueness, mere fool, mere poet. End of Part 4, Chapter 74 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4, Chapter 75 Science Thus sang the magician, and all who were present went like birds, unawares, into the net of his artful and melancholy voluptuousness. Only the spiritually conscientious one had not been caught. He at once snatched the harp from the magician, and called out, Air! Let in good air! Let in Zarathustra! Thou makest this cave sultry and poisonous, thou bad old magician. Thou seducest, thou false one, thou subtle one, to unknown desires and deserts. And alas, that such as thou should talk and make ado about the truth. 
alas, to all free spirits who are not on their guard against such magicians. It is all over with their freedom. Thou teachest and temptest back into prisons. Thou old melancholy devil, out of thy lament soundeth the lurement. Thou resemblest those who with their praise of chastity secretly invite to voluptuousness. Thus spake the conscientious one. The old magician, however, looked about him, enjoying his triumph, and on that account put up with the annoyance which the conscientious one caused him. Be still, said he with modest voice. Good songs want to re-echo well. After good songs, one should be long silent. Thus do all those present, the higher men. Thou, however, hast perhaps understood but little of my song? In thee there is little of the magic spirit. Thou praisest me, replied the conscientious one, in that thou separatest me from thyself. Very well. But, ye others, what do I see? Ye still sit there, all of you, with lusting eyes. Ye free spirits, whither hath your freedom gone? Ye almost seem to me to resemble those who have long looked at bad girls dancing naked. Your souls themselves dance. In you, ye higher men, there must be more of that which the magician calleth his evil spirit of magic and deceit. We must indeed be different. And verily, we spake and thought long enough together ere Zarathustra came home to his cave for me not to be unaware that we are different. We seek different things, even here aloft, ye and I. For I seek more security. On that account have I come to Zarathustra. For he is still the most steadfast tower, and will. Today, when everything tottereth, when all the earth quaketh, ye, however, when I see what eyes ye make, it almost seemeth to me that ye seek more insecurity, more horror, more danger, more earthquake. Ye long, it almost seemeth so to me, forgive my presumption, ye higher men, ye long for the worst and dangerousest life, which frighteneth me most, for the life of wild beasts, for forests, caves, steep mountains, and labyrinthine gorges. And it is not those who lead out of danger that please you best, but those who lead you away from all paths, the misleaders. But if such longing in you be actual, it seemeth to me nevertheless to be impossible. For fear, that is man's original and fundamental feeling. Through fear everything is explained, original sin and original virtue. Through fear, there grew also my virtue, that is to say, science. For fear of wild animals, that hath been longest fostered in man, inclusive of the animal which he concealeth and feareth in himself. Zarathustra calleth it the beast inside. Such prolonged ancient fear at last becomes subtle, spiritual, and intellectual. At present, methinketh, it is called science. Thus spake the conscientious one. But Zarathustra, who had just come back into the cave, and had heard and divined this last discourse, threw a handful of roses to the conscientious one, and laughed on account of his truths. Why, he exclaimed, what did I hear just now? Verily it seemeth to me, thou art a fool, or else I myself am one and quietly and quickly will I put thy truth upside down. For fear is an exception with us, courage, however, an adventure, and delight in the uncertain, in the unattempted, courage seemeth to me the entire primitive history of man. The wildest and most courageous animals hath he envied and robbed of all their virtues. Thus only did he become man. This courage at last becomes subtle, spiritual, and intellectual, this human courage, with eagle's pinions and serpent's wisdom. This, it seemeth to me, 
is called at present Zarathustra, cried all of them there assembled, as if with one voice, and burst out at the same time into a great laughter. There arose, however, from them, as it were, a heavy cloud. Even the magician laughed, and said wisely, Well, it is gone, mine evil spirit. And did I not myself warn you against it, when I said that it was a deceiver, a lying and deceiving spirit? especially when it showeth itself naked. But what can I do with regard to its tricks? Have I created it and the world? Well, let us be good again, and of good cheer. And although Zarathustra looketh with evil eye, just see him, he disliketh me. Ere night cometh, will he again learn to love and laud me? He cannot live long without committing such follies. He loveth his enemies. This art knoweth he better than any one I have seen. But he taketh revenge for it on his friends. Thus spake the old magician, and the higher men applauded him, so that Zarathustra went round, and mischievously and lovingly shook hands with his friends, like one who hath to make amends, and apologize to every one for something. When, however, he had thereby come to the door of his cave, lo, then had he again a longing for the good air outside, and for his animals, and wished to steal out. End of Part 4, Chapter 75「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4, Chapter 76 Among Daughters of the Desert 1. Go not away, said then the wanderer, who called himself Zarathustra's shadow. Abide with us, otherwise the old gloomy affliction might again fall upon us. Now hath that old magician given us of his worst for our good, and lo, the good pious pope there hath tears in his eyes, and hath quite embarked again upon the sea of melancholy. Those kings may well put on a good air before us still, for that have they learned, best of us all at present. Had they, however, no one to see them, I wager that with them also the bad game would again commence. The bad game of drifting clouds, of damp melancholy, of curtained heavens, of stolen suns, of howling autumn winds. The bad game of our howling and crying for help. Abide with us, O Zarathustra. Here there is much concealed misery that wisheth to speak, much evening, much cloud, much damp air. Thou hast nourished us with strong food for men and powerful proverbs. Do not let the weakly, womanly spirits attack us anew at desert. Thou alone makest the air around thee strong and clear. Did I ever find anywhere on earth such good air as with thee in thy cave? Many lands have I seen, my nose hath learned to test and estimate many kinds of air, but with thee do my nostrils taste their greatest delight. Unless it be, unless it be, unless it be, do forgive an old recollection, forgive me an old after-dinner song, which I once composed amongst daughters of the desert. For with them was there equally good, clear, oriental air. There was I furthest from cloudy, damp, melancholy old Europe. Then did I love such oriental maidens and other blue kingdoms of heaven, over which hang no clouds and no thoughts. Ye would not believe how charmingly they sat there, when they did not dance, profound, but without thoughts, like little secrets, like beribboned riddles, like desert nuts, many-hued and foreign, forsooth, but without clouds, riddles which can be guessed, 
To please such maidens, I then composed an after-dinner psalm. Thus spake the wanderer, who called himself Zarathustra's shadow, and before anyone answered him, he had seized the harp of the old magician, crossed his legs, and looked calmly and sagely around him. With his nostrils, however, he inhaled the air slowly and questioningly, like one who in new countries tasteth new foreign air. Afterward he began to sing with a kind of roaring. 2. The deserts grow. Woe him who doth them hide. Ha! Solemnly, in effect solemnly, a worthy beginning, Afric manner, solemnly, of a lion worthy, or perhaps of a virtuous howl monkey, but it's not to you, ye friendly damsels dearly loved, at whose own feet to me, the first occasion, to a European under palm trees, a seat is now granted. Selah. Wonderful, truly, here do I sit now, the desert nigh, and yet I am so far still from the desert, even in naught yet deserted. That is, I am swallowed down by this, this smallest oasis. It opened up, just yawning, its loveliest mouth agape, most sweet odored of all mouthlets. Then fell I right in, right down, right through, in mong you, ye friendly damsels dearly loved. Selah. Hail, hail to that whale, fish-like, if it thus for its guest's convenience made things nice. Ye well know, surely, my learned illusion. Hail to its belly, if it had error, a such loveliest oasis belly as this is, though, however, I doubt about it. With this come I out of old Europe, that doubteth more eagerly than doth any elderly married woman. May the Lord improve it. Amen. Here do I sit now, in this, the smallest oasis, like a date, indeed, brown, quite sweet, gold separating, for rounded mouth of maiden longing, but yet still more for youthful, maid-like, ice-cold and snow-white and incisory front teeth, and for such assuredly pine the hearts all of ardent date-fruits. Selah. To the there named South Fruits now, similar, all too similar, do I lie here, by little flying insects, round sniffled and round played, and also by yet littler, foolisher, and peckabler wishes and fantasies, environed by you, ye silent, presentientest maiden kittens, doo-doo and sulika, round sphinxed, that into one word I may crowd much feeling. Forgive me, O God, all such speech sinning. Sit I here, the best of air sniffling, paradisal air, truly, bright and buoyant air, golden mottled, as goodly air as ever, from lunar orb down fell. Be it by hazard, or supervened it by arrogancy, as the ancient poets relate it. But, Doubter, I am now calling it in question. With this do I come indeed out of Europe, that doubteth more eagerly than doth any elderly married woman. May the Lord improve it. Amen. This, the finest air drinking, with nostrils outswelled like goblets, lacking future, lacking remembrances, thus do I sit here. Ye friendly damsels, dearly loved, and look at the palm tree there, how it to a dance girl like doth bow and bend and on its haunches bob. One doth it too when one vieweth it long to a dance girl like who, as it seemeth to me, too long and dangerously persistent. Always, always, just on single leg hath stood. Then forgot she thereby, as it seemeth to me, the other leg? For vainly I, at least, did search for the amissing fellow-jewel, namely the other leg, in the sanctified precincts, nigh her very dearest, very tenderest, flapping and fluttering and flickering skirting. 
Yea, if ye should, ye beauteous friendly ones, quite take my word. She hath, alas, lost it. Who, 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 who? It is away, forever away, the other leg. O oh, pity for that loveliest other leg! Where may it now tarry, all forsaken weeping, the lonesomest leg? In fear, perhaps, before a furious, yellow, blonde, and curled leonine monster? Or perhaps even gnawed away, nibbled badly, most wretched, woeful, woeful, nibbled badly, say la. O oh, weep ye not, gentle spirits, weep ye not, ye date-fruit spirits, milk-bosoms, ye sweetwood heart purslets, weep ye no more, pallid doo do Be a man, Sulika, bold, bold, or else should there perhaps be something strengthening, heart-strengthening, here most proper be, some inspiring text, some solemn exhortation, ha! Up now, honor, moral honor, European honor, blow again, continue, bellows box of virtue, ha! Once more thy roaring, thy moral roaring, as a virtuous lion, nigh the daughters of deserts roaring, for virtue's out howl, ye very dearest maidens, is more than every European fervor, European hot hunger. And now do I stand here, as European, I can't be different. God's help to me. Amen. The deserts grow. Woe him who doth them hide. End of Part 4, Chapter 76「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Thomas Common Part 4, Chapter 77 The Awakening Section 1 After the song of the Wanderer in Shadow, the cave became all at once full of noise and laughter, and since the assembled guests all spake simultaneously, and even the ass encouraged thereby no longer remained silent, a little aversion and scorn for his visitors came over Zarathustra, although he rejoiced at their gladness, for it seemed to him a sign of convalescence. So he slipped out into the open air and spoke to his animals. Whither hath their distress now gone? said he and already did he himself feel relieved of his petty disgust. With me it seemeth that they have unlearned their cries of distress, though alas, not yet their crying. And Zarathustra stopped his ears, for just then did the ye ah of the ass mix strangely with the noisy jubilation of those higher men. They are merry, he began again, and who knoweth, perhaps at their host's expense. And if they have learned of me to laugh, Still it is not my laughter they have learned. But what matter about that? They are old people. They recover in their own way. They laugh in their own way. Mine ears have already endured worse, and have not become peevish. This day is a victory. He already yieldeth. He fleeth, the spirit of gravity, mine old arch-enemy. How well this day is about to end, which began so badly and gloomily, and it is about to end. Already cometh the evening. Over the sea rideth it hither, the good rider. How it bobbeth, the blessed one, the home, returning one, in its purple saddles. The sky gazeth brightly thereon. The world lieth deep. O oh, all ye strange ones who have come to me, it is already worth while to have lived with me. Thus spake Zarathustra. And again came the cries and laughter of the higher men out of the cave. Then began he anew. They bite at it, my bait taketh. There departeth also from them their enemy, the spirit of gravity. Now do they learn to laugh at themselves. Do I hear rightly? My virile food taketh effect, my strong and savoury sayings. And verily, I did not nourish them with flatulent vegetables. 
but with warrior food, with conqueror food. New desires did I awaken. New hopes are in their arms and legs. Their hearts expand. They find new words. Soon will their spirits breathe wantonness. Such food may sure enough not be proper for children, nor even for longing girls, old and young. One persuadeth their bowels otherwise. I am not their physician and teacher. The disgust departeth from these higher men. Well, that is my victory, and my domain they become assured. All stupid shame fleeth away. They empty themselves. They empty their hearts. Good times return unto them. They keep holiday and ruminate. They become thankful. That do I take as the best sign. They become thankful. Not long will it be ere they devise festivals and put up memorials to their old joys. They are convalescents. Thus spoke Zarathustra joyfully to his heart and gazed outward. His animals, however, pressed up to him and honoured his happiness and his silence. Section 2 All on a sudden, however, Zarathustra's ear was frightened. For the cave, which had hitherto been full of noise and laughter, became all at once still as death. His nose, however, smelt a sweet-scented vapour and incense odour, as if from burning pine cones. What happeneth? What are they about? he asked himself, and stole up to the entrance, that he might be able, unobserved, to see his guests. But wonder upon wonder! What was he then obliged to behold with his own eyes? They have all of them become pious again. They pray, they are mad, said he, and was astonished beyond measure. And forsooth, all these higher men, the two kings, the pope out of service, the evil magician, the voluntary beggar, the wanderer in shadow, the old soothsayer, the spiritually conscientious one, and the ugliest man, they all lay on their knees like children and credulous old women, and worshipped the ass. And just then began the ugliest man to gurgle and snort, as if something unutterable in him tried to find expression. When, however, he had actually found words, behold, it was a pious, strange litany, in praise of the adored and sensed ass. And the litany sounded thus, Amen, and glory and honour, and wisdom and thanks, and praise and strength be to our God, from everlasting to everlasting. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. He carrieth our burdens, he hath taken upon him the form of a servant. He is patient of heart, and never saith nay, and he who loveth his God chastiseth him. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. He speaketh not, except that he ever saith yea to the world which he created. Thus doth he extol his world. It is his artfulness that speaketh not. Thus is he really found wrong. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. Uncomely goeth he through the world. Grey is the favourite colour in which he wrappeth his virtue. Hath he spirit? Then doth he conceal it. Every one, however, believeth in his long ears. The ass, however, here brayeth, Ye are. What hidden wisdom it is to wear long ears, and only to say, Yea, and never nay. Hath he not created the world in his own image, namely, as stupid as possible? The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. Thou goest straight and crooked ways. It concerneth thee little what seemeth straight or crooked unto us men. Beyond good and evil is thy domain. It is thine innocence not to know what innocence is. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. Lo, how thou spurnest none from thee, neither beggars nor kings. Thou sufferest little children to come unto thee, and when the bad boys decoy thee, then sayest thou simply, Ye are. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. Thou lovest she asses and fresh figs, Thou art no food despiser. A thistle tickleth thy heart when thou chancest to be hungry. There is the wisdom of a god therein. The ass, however, here brayed, Ye are. End of part 4, chapter 77. Read and recorded by Mark Lee. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Jerry Retief, Durban, South Africa, 11th September 2008. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common. Part 4, Chapter 78 The Ass Festival 1. At this place in the litany, however, Zarathustra could no longer control himself. He himself cried out, yee louder even than the ass, and sprang into the midst of his maddened guests. Whatever are you about, you grown-up children? he exclaimed, pulling up the praying ones from the ground. Alas, if anyone else except Zarathustra had seen you, everyone would think you the worst blasphemers, or the very foolishest old women, with your new belief. And thou thyself, thou old Pope, how is it in accordance with thee to adore an ass in such a manner as God? O oh, Zarathustra, answered the Pope, forgive me, but in divine matters I am more enlightened even than thou, and it is right that it should be so. Better to adore God so in this form than in no form at all. Think over this saying, mine exalted friend. Thou wilt readily divine that in such a saying there is wisdom. He who said God is a spirit made the greatest stride and slide hitherto made on earth towards unbelief. Such a dictum is not easily amended again on earth. Mine old heart leapeth and boundeth, because there is still something to adore on earth. Forgive it, O Zarathustra, to an old pious pontiff heart. And thou, said Zarathustra to the wanderer and shadow, thou callest and thinkest thyself a free spirit, and thou here practisest such idolatry and hierolatry. Worse, verily, doest thou here than with thy bad brown girls, thou bad new believer. It is sad enough, answered the wanderer and shadow. Thou art right, but how can I help it? The old god liveth again, O Zarathustra. Thou mayest say what thou wilt. The ugliest man is to blame for it all. He hath reawakened him and if he say that he once killed him with God's death, is always just a prejudice. And thou, said Zarathustra, thou bad old magician, what didst thou do? Who ought to believe any longer in thee in this free age, when thou believest in such divine donkeyism? It was a stupid thing that thou didst. How couldst thou? A shrewd man do such a stupid thing. O oh, Zarathustra, answered the shrewd magician, thou art right. It was a stupid thing. It was also repugnant to me. And thou even, said Zarathustra to the spiritually conscientious one, consider and put thy finger to thy nose. Doth nothing go against thy conscience here? Is thy spirit not too cleanly for this praying and the fumes of those devotees? There is something therein, said the spiritually conscientious one, and put his finger to his nose. There is something in this spectacle which even doeth good to my conscience. Perhaps I dare not believe in God. Certain it is, however, that God seemeth to me most worthy of belief in this form. God is said to be eternal, according to the testimony of the most pious. He who hath so much time taketh his time, as slow and as stupid as possible. Thereby can such a one nevertheless go very far, and he who hath too much spirit might well become infatuated with stupidity and folly. Think of thyself, O Zarathustra. 
Thou, thyself, verily, even thou, couldst well become an ass through superabundance of wisdom. Doth not the true sage willingly walk on the crookedest paths? The evidence teacheth it, O Zarathustra, thine own evidence. And thou thyself finally, said Zarathustra, and turned towards the ugliest man, who still lay on the ground stretching up his arms to the ass, for he gave it wine to drink. Say, thou nondescript, what hast thou been about? Thou seemest to be transformed, thine eyes glow, the mantle of the sublime covereth thine ugliness. What didst thou do? Is it then true what they say, that thou hast again awakened him? And why? Was he not for good reasons killed and made away with? Thou thyself seemest to me awakened. What didst thou do? Why didst thou turn round? Why didst thou get converted? Speak, thou nondescript. O Zarathustra, answered the ugliest man, thou art a rogue. Whether he yet liveth, or again liveth, or is thoroughly dead, which of us both knoweth that best? I ask thee, one thing, however, do I know. From thyself did I learn at once, O Zarathustra, he who wanteth to kill most thoroughly, laugheth. Not by wrath, but by laughter doth one kill. Thus spakest thou once, O Zarathustra, thou hidden one, thou destroyer without wrath, thou dangerous saint, thou art a rogue. 2. Then, however, did it come to pass that Zarathustra, astonished at such merely roguish answers, jumped back to the door of his cave, and turning towards all his guests, cried out with a strong voice, O oh, ye wags, all of you, ye buffoons, why do you dissemble and disguise yourselves before me? How the hearts of all of you convulsed with delight and wickedness, because ye had at last become again like little children, namely pious, because ye at last did again as children do, namely prayed, folded your hands, and said, Good God. But now leave, I pray you, this nursery, mine own cave, where today all childishness is carried on. Cool down, here outside your hot child wantonness and heart tumult. To be sure, except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into that kingdom of heaven. And Zarathustra pointed aloft with his hands. But we do not at all want to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We have become men. So we want the kingdom of earth. Three. And once more began Zarathustra to speak. O oh, my new friends, said he, ye strange ones, ye higher men, how well do ye now please me, since ye have again become joyful, ye have verily all blossomed forth. It seemeth to me that for such flowers as you, new festivals are required. A little valiant nonsense, some divine service, and ass festival, some old joyful Zarathustra fool, some blusterer to blow your souls bright. Forget not this night and this ass festival, ye higher men, that did ye devise when with me, that do I take as a good omen, such things only the convalescents devise. And should ye celebrate it again, this ass festival, do it from love to yourselves, do it also from love to me, and in remembrance of me. Thus spake Zarathustra. End of part 4, chapter 78. Read and recorded by Jerry Retief, Durban, South Africa, 11th September, 2008.
This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 4, Chapter 79. The Drunken Song. One. Meanwhile one after another had gone out into the open air, and into the cool, thoughtful night. Zarathustra himself, however, led the ugliest man by the hand, that he might show him his night world, and the great round moon, and the silvery waterfalls near his cave. There they at last stood still beside one another, all of them old people, but comforted, brave hearts, and astonished in themselves that it was so well with them on earth. The mystery of the night, however, came nigher and nigher to their hearts, and anew Zarathustra thought to himself, Oh, how well do they now please me, these higher men! But he did not say it aloud, for he respected their happiness and their silence. Then, however, there happened that which in this astonishingly long day was most astonishing. The ugliest man began once more, and for the last time, to gurgle and snort. And when he had at length found expression, behold, there sprung a question plump and plain out of his mouth, a good, deep, clear question which moved the hearts of all who listened to him. My friends, all of you, said the ugliest man, what think ye, for the sake of this day? I am for the first time content to have lived my entire life, and that I testify so much is still not enough for me. It is worth while living on earth one day, one festival with Zarathustra, hath taught me to love the earth. Was that life? Will I say unto death? Well, once more! My friends, what think ye? Will ye not, like me, say unto death, Was that life? For the sake of Zarathustra, well, once more. Thus spake the ugliest man. It was not, however, far from midnight. And what took place then, think ye? As soon as the higher men heard this question, they became all at once conscious of their transformation and convalescence, and of him who was the cause thereof. Then did they rush up to Zarathustra, thanking, honouring, caressing him, kissing his hands, each in his own peculiar way, so that some laughed and some wept. The old soothsayer, however, danced with delight, and though he was then, as some narrators suppose, full of sweet wine, he was certainly still fuller of sweet life and had renounced all weariness. There are then even those who narrate that the ass then danced, for not in vain had the ugliest man previously given it wine to drink. That may be the case, or it may be otherwise, and if in truth the ass did not dance that evening, there nevertheless happened then greater and rarer wonders than the dancing of an ass would have been. In short, as the proverb of Zarathustra saith, what doth it matter? 2. When, however, this took place with the ugliest man, Zarathustra stood there like one drunken, his glance dulled, his tongue faltered, and his feet staggered. And who could divine what thoughts then passed through Zarathustra's soul? Apparently, however, his spirit retreated and fled in advance, and was in remote distances and as it were, wandered on high mountain ridges, as it standeth written, twixt two seas, wandering twixt the past and the future as a heavy cloud. Gradually, however, while the higher men held him in their arms, he came back to himself a little, and resisted with his hands the crowd of the honouring and caring ones, but he did not speak. All at once, however, he turned his head quickly, for he seemed to hear something, then he laid his finger on his mouth and said, Come! And immediately, 
it became still and mysterious round about. From the depth, however, there came up slowly the sound of a clock bell. Zarathustra listened there too, like the higher men. Then, however, he laid his finger on his mouth the second time, and said again, Come! Come! It is getting on to midnight! And his voice had changed, but still he had not moved from the spot. Then it became yet stiller and more mysterious, and everything hearkened to even the ass, and Zarathustra's noble animals, the eagle and the serpent. Likewise the cave of Zarathustra and the big cool moon, and the night itself. Zarathustra, however, laid his hand upon his mouth for a third time and said, Come! 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 Now let us wander! It is the hour! Let us wander into the night! 3. Ye higher men, it is getting on to midnight. Then will I say something into your ears, as the old clock bell saith it into mine ear, as mysteriously, as frightfully, and as cordially as the midnight clock bell speaketh it to me, which hath experienced more than one man, which hath already counted the smarting throbbings of your father's hearts. Ah, ah, how it sigheth, how it laugheth in its dream, the old deep, deep midnight. Hush, hush, then is there many a thing heard which may not be heard by day. Now, however, in the cool air, even in all the tumult of your hearts, hath become still. Now doth it speak, now is it heard. Now doth it steal into overwakeful, nocturnal souls. Ah, ah, how the midnight sigheth, how it laugheth in its dream. Hearest thou not how it mysteriously, frightfully, and cordially speaketh unto thee, the old, deep, deep midnight? O oh, man, take heed. 4. Woe to me, whither has time gone? Have I not drunk into deep wells? The world sleepeth. Ah, ah! The dog howleth, the moon shineth. Rather will I die, rather will I die than say unto you what my midnight heart now thinketh. Already have I died. It is over. Spider, why spinnest thou around me? Wilt thou have blood? Ah, ah! The dew falleth, the hour cometh. The hour in which I froze and freeze, which asketh, and asketh, and asketh, who hath sufficient courage for it? Who is to be the master of the world? Who is going to say, Thus shall ye flow, ye great and small streams? The hour approacheth, O man, thou high man, take heed. This talk is for fine ears. For thine ears, what saith deep midnight's voice indeed? 5. It carried me away, my soul danceth, day's work, day's work, who is to be the master of the world? The moon is cool, the wind is still, ah, ah, have ye already flown high enough? Ye have danced, a leg Nevertheless, is not a wing. Ye good dancers, now is all delight over. Wine hath become lees, every cup hath become brittle, the sepulchres mutter. Ye have not flown high enough, now do the sepulchres mutter. Free the dead! Why is it so long night? Doth not the moon make us drunken? Ye higher men, free the sepulchres, awaken the corpses. Ah! Why doth the worm still burrow? There approacheth, there approacheth the hour, there boometh the clock bell, there thrilleth still the heart, there burroweth still the wood worm, the heart worm. Ah, ah, the world is deep. 
6. Sweet liar, sweet liar, I love thy tone, thy drunken, run and saline tone. How long, how far hath come unto me thy tone, from the distance, from the ponds of love, thou old clock bell, thou sweet liar, every pain hath torn thy heart, father pain, father's pain, forefather's pain, thy speech hath become ripe, ripe like the golden autumn and the afternoon, like mine anchorite heart, thou sayest thou, the world itself hath become ripe, the grape turned brown, now doth it wish to die, to die of happiness. Ye higher men, do you not feel it? There welleth up mysteriously an odour, a perfume and odour of eternity, a rose-blessed, brown, gold wine odour of old happiness, of drunken midnight death happiness, which singeth, the world is deep, and deeper than the day could read. 7. Leave me alone, leave me alone. I am too pure for thee, touch me not. Hath not my world just now become perfect? My skin is too pure for thy hands. Leave me alone, thou dull, doltish, stupid day. Is not the midnight brighter? Thy purest are to be the masters of the world, the least known the strongest, the midnight souls, who is brighter and deeper than any day. O day, thou gropest for me, thou feelest for my happiness. For thee I am rich, lonesome, a treasure pit, a gold chamber. O world, thou wantest me? Am I worldly for thee? Am I spiritual for thee? Am I divine for thee? But day and world, ye are too coarse, have cleverer hands, grasped after deeper happiness, after deeper unhappiness, grasp after some god, grasp not after me. Mine unhappiness, my happiness is deep, thou strange day, but yet I am no god, no god's hell, deep is its woe. 8. God's woe is deeper, thou strange world. Grasp at God's woe, not at me. What am I? A drunken sweet liar, a midnight liar, a bell frog, which no one understandeth, but which must speak before deaf ones, ye higher men. For ye do not understand me. Gone, gone, O youth, O noontide, O afternoon. Now have come evening, and night, and midnight. The dog howleth, the wind. Is the wind not a dog? It whineth, it barketh, it howleth. Ah, ah! How she sigheth, how she laugheth, how she wheezeth, and panteth, the midnight. How she just now speaketh soberly, this drunken poetess. Hath she not perhaps overdrunk her drunkenness? Hath she not become over-awake? Doth she ruminate? Her woe doth she ruminate over in her dream, the old deep midnight, and still more her joy. For joy, although woe be deep, joy is deeper still than grief can be. 9. Thou grapevine, why dost thou praise me? Have I not cut thee? I am cruel? Thou bleedest. What meaneth thy praise of my drunken cruelty? Whatever hath become perfect, everything mature wanteth to die, so sayest thou. Blessed, blessed be the vinter's knife. But everything immature wanteth to live, alas. Woe saith, hence, go, away, thou woe. But everything that suffereth wanteth to live, that it must become mature and lively and longing. Longing for the further, the higher, the brighter. I want heirs, so saith everything that suffereth. I want children, I do not want myself. 
Joy, however, doth not want heirs. It doth not want children. Joy wanteth itself. It wanteth eternity. It wanteth recurrence. It wanteth everything eternally like itself. Woe saith, break, bleed, thou heart, wander, thou leg, thy wing, fly, onward, upward, thou pain. Well, cheer up, O my old heart. Woe saith, hence, go. 10. Ye higher men, what think ye? Am I a soothsayer? Or a dreamer? Or a drunkard? Or a dream reader? Or a midnight bell? Or a drop of dew? Or a fume and fragrance of eternity? Hear ye it not? Smell ye it not? Just now hath my world become perfect. Midnight is also midday. Pain is also a joy. Curse is also a blessing. Night is also a sun. Go away, or ye will learn that a sage is also a fool. Said ye ever yea to one joy? O my friends, then say ye yea also to all woe. All things are enlinked, enlaced, and enarmoured. Want ye ever once to come twice? Said ye ever, Thou pleasest me happiness. Instant, moment, then wanted all ye all to come back again. All anew, all eternal, all enlinked, enlaced, and enarmoured. Oh, then, did ye love the world? Ye eternal ones, ye loved it eternally, and for all time and also unto woe did ye say, Hence, go, but come back. For all joys want eternity. 11. All joys wanteth the eternity of all things. It wanteth honey, it wanteth lees, it wanteth drunken midnight, it wanteth graves, it wanteth grave tears consolation, it wanteth gilded evening red. What doth joy not want? It is thirstier, heartier, hungrier, more frightful, more mysterious than all woe. It wanteth itself, it biteth into itself. The ring's will writeth in it. It wanteth love, it wanteth hate. It is over rich, it bestoweth, it throweth away. It beggeth for someone to take away from it. It thanketh the taker it would fain be hated. So rich is joy that it thirsteth for woe, for hell, for hate, for shame, for the lame, for the world, for this world. O oh, ye know it indeed, ye higher men, for you doth it long this joy, this irrepressible blessed joy, for your woe, ye failures, for failures longeth all eternal joy. For joys all want themselves, therefore do ye also want grief. O happiness, O pain, O break thou heart, ye higher men, do learn it. The joys want eternity, joy wanteth eternity of all things. They want deep, profound eternity. 12. Have ye now learned my song? Have ye divined what it would say? Well, cheer up, ye higher men, sing now my rondelay. Sing now yourselves the song, the name of which is Once More, the signification of which is Unto All Eternity. Sing, ye higher men, Zarathustra's rondelay. O man, take heed. What saith deep midnight's voice indeed? I slept my sleep, from deepest dream I woke and plead. The world is deep, and deeper than the day can read. Deep is its woe, joy, deeper still than grief can be. 
Woe saith, hence, go. But joys all want eternity. Want deep, profound eternity. End of part four, chapter seventy nine. The Drunken Song. This is a LibriVox.org recording by Tim Sherman Chase. This recording is in the public domain. Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Thomas Common. Part 4, Chapter 80. The Sign. In the morning, however, after this night, Zarathustra jumped up from his couch, and having girded his loins, he came out of his cave, glowing and strong, like a morning sun coming out of gloomy mountains. Thou great star, spake he, as he had spoken once before, thou deep eye of happiness, what would be all thy happiness if thou hast not those for whom thou shinest? And if they remained in their chambers whilst thou art already awake, and comest and bestowest and distributest, how would thy proud modesty upbraid for it? Well, they still sleep, these higher men, whilst I am awake. They are not my proper companions. Not for them do I await here in my mountains. At my work I want to be, at my day. But they understand not what are the signs of my morning. My step is not for them the awakening call. They still sleep in my cave. Their dream still drinketh at my drunken songs. The ordent ear for me, the obedient ear, is lacking in their limbs. This had Zarathustra spoken to his heart when the sun rose. Then he looked inquiringly aloft, for he had heard above him the sharp call of his eagle. Well, he called upwards, thus it is pleasing and proper to me. Mine animals are awake, for I am awake. My eagle is awake, and like me honoureth the sun. With eagle talons does it grasp at the new light. Ye are my proper animals. I love you. But still do I lack my proper men. Thus spake Zarathustra. Then, however, it happened that all on a sudden he became aware that he was flocked around and fluttered around as if by innumerable birds. The whizzing of so many wings, however, and the crowding around his head were so great that he shut his eyes. And verily there came down upon him, as it were a cloud, like a cloud of arrows which poureth upon a new enemy. But behold, here it was a cloud of love, and showered upon a new friend. What happened unto me, thought Zarathustra in his astonished heart, and slowly seated himself on the big stone which lay close to the exit from his cave. But while he grasped around with his hands, around him, above him and below him, and repelled the tender birds, behold, there then happened to him something still stranger. For he grasped thereby unawares into a th mass of thick, warm, shaggy hair. At the same time, however, there soundeth before him a roar, a long, soft, lion roar. The sign cometh, said Zarathustra, and a change came over his heart. And in truth, when it turned clear before him, there lay a yellow, powerful animal at his feet, resting his head upon its knee, unwilling to leave him out of love, and doing like a dog which again findeth its old master. The doves, however, were no less eager with their love than the lion. And whenever a dove whisked over its nose, the lion shook its head, and wondered, and laughed. When all this went on, Zarathustra spoke only a word. My children are nigh! My children! Then he became quite mute. His heart, however, was loosed, and from his eyes there dropped down tears, and fell upon his hands. And he took no further notice of anything, but sat there motionless without repelling the animals further. Then flew the doves to and fro, 
and perched on his shoulder and caressed his white hair, and he did not tire of their tenderness and joyousness. The strong lion, however, licked always the tears that fell on Zarathustra's hands, and roared and growled shyly. Thus did the animals do. All this went on for a long time, or a short time, for properly speaking there is no time on this earth for such things. Meanwhile, however, the higher men awakened in Zarathustra's cave, and marshalling themselves for a procession to go to meet Zarathustra, and give him their morning greeting, for they had found, when they awakened, that he no longer tarried with them. When, however, they reached the door of the cave, and the noise of their steps preceded them, the lion started violently, and turned away all at once from Zarathustra, and roaring wildly, sprung towards the cave. The higher men, however, when they heard the lion roaring, cried all aloud as with one voice, fled back, and vanished in an instant. Zarathustra himself, however, stunned and strange, arose from his seat, looked around him, stood there astonished, acquiring of his heart, bethought himself, and remained alone. What did I hear? he said at last slowly. What happened unto me just now? But soon there came to him his recollection, and he took in at a glance all that had taken place between yesterday and today. Here is indeed the stone, he said, and stroked his beard. On it sat I yestermorn, and here came the soothsayer unto me, and here heard I first the cry which I heard just now, the great cry of distress. O ye higher men, your distress was it that the old soothsayer foretold to me yestermorn. Unto your distress did he want to seduce and tempt me. O Zarathustra, he said to me, I come to seduce thee to thy last sin. To my last sin, cried Zarathustra, and laughed angrily at his own words. What hath been reserved for me as my last sin? And once more Zarathustra became absorbed in himself, and sat down again on the big stone and meditated. Suddenly he sprang up. Fellow suffering! Fellow suffering with the higher men! He cried out, and his countenance changed into brass. Well... That hath its time! My suffering, and my fellow suffering, what matter about them? Do I then strive after happiness? I strive after my work. Well, the lion hath come, my children are nigh, Zarathustra hath grown ripe. Mine hour hath come. This is my morning, my day beginneth. Arise now, arise, thou great noontide. Thus spake Zarathustra and left his cave, glowing and strong, like a morning sun coming out of gloomy mountains. End of Thus Spake Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Thomas Common.